The scene starts at a church where birds are chirping and tweeting. Pietro is sitting on the bench and wonders how things could go so wrong. He knows that his plan went all wrong and wonders when Iske and Ruby became so close. He also believes that perhaps he should have broken Ruby's legs instead. Suddenly, someone states to Pietro that it seems that he has merely helped Ruby and Iske consummate their marriage. The stranger adds that it must put him in quite a bind to tell the master about it. Pietro replies, Well, hey, who do we have here? If it isn't our impressive spy. Pietro adds that this isn't good news for him either, as his objective just got that much further out of his reach. We also see that the stranger is actually the archbishop. We then transition to the next scene where we notice Ruby sleeping as Iska is staring at her. Iska then brushes her hair. All of a sudden, Ruby calls out Iski's name. Upon hearing his name, Iski questions her if he woke her up. As Ruby is waking up, she responds, No, you didn't. Are you heading out already? Iski agrees with her and mentions that he'll have to leave now so that he can come home early. As Ruby is still waking up from her sleep, she states that she understands. Iske chuckles upon noticing her waking up. He also pats her on the head and tells her to get more sleep. He adds that she looks like she's still sleepy. Ruby disagrees with him and mentions that she's wide awake. She then reaches her hands out and hugs him. As she's hugging Iska, she states that she doesn't want to let him go. She adds that it would be so nice if she could go with him. Iska starts to blush upon hearing these statements. He then kisses Ruby on the cheeks. As he leans towards her, he tells her that even if she were to come with him, she wouldn't get to see her monster friends. Ruby mentions to him that this isn't what she meant. Iski confirms with her if she won't run off with her monster friends while he's not around. He adds that maybe she'll be lured away by chocolates. Ruby shouts that no, she won't. She also adds that she's hosting a tea party with Ellen this afternoon in the Garden of Water that he made for her. Iska states that she seems to like that garden a lot. Ruby tells him that of course she does. Iska then mentions to her that she can let him know if she needs anything else in the garden, such as decorations for her little friends. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby realizes that the only friends she has are either little girls or demonic monsters. Iska then adds that she shouldn't hesitate to tell him anything as he hasn't learned much about her until now. As Ruby smiles, she agrees with Iska and states that she will tell him. Ruby also starts thinking about how she always thought that she knew Iska pretty well. However, she now realizes that all she really knew about him is based on the novel. She hardly knew anything about the Iska she's spending her life with. Suddenly, Iski reaches out his hands and hugs Ruby. As he's hugging her, he tells Ruby that he really doesn't want to go. Ruby mentions to him that, however, he has to go now so that he has time to spend with her later. Iski then stops hugging her. He further reassures Ruby that he'll be back as soon as possible, so she won't be waiting for too long. As Ruby is smiling and waving bye to him, she states that she understands and wishes for him to have a nice trip. She also starts to think about how she's never had such peaceful days as this in her whole life. We further learn that sometimes she wonders if she really deserves this kind of happiness. But every time she felt that way, it just made her want to lose herself in the bliss that she feels in this moment. Even if this turns out to have all been a dream that vanishes when she opens her eyes. We then transition to the next scene where we see Ruby getting ready by her maids for the tea party. However, the two maids are fighting amongst themselves as to what earrings Ruby should wear. All of a sudden, the ladies hear a knock on the door. The person knocking on the door turns out to be Iski's father. Upon Ruby realizing this, she requests him to come in. As Iska's father is coming inside the room, he greets Ruby and questions her if she's going out. Ruby replies, Yes, I'm having a tea party with Ellen at the garden. Upon hearing this response, Iski's father tells her that he's glad that Ellen is taking good care of her. Ruby agrees with him and asks Iski's father if he's going out as well. Iska's father responds, Yes. I'm only dropping by before attending a meeting at the palace. Ruby mentions to him that she understands. She also wonders why he's here. Iska's father then states that he heard Iska entrusted her with the key to the jewelry safe. Ruby starts to feel guilty upon hearing this statement and agrees with him that he did. 
She also wonders if Iska's father is here to take it back. She further believes that maybe he feels displeased about it. Iska's father then questions Ruby about what Iska said to her when he gave it to her. Ruby nervously replies, Ooh, well, he said he trusts me to take good care of it. However, Ruby is aware that Iska actually said that she can take whatever she wants. Upon hearing this response, Iska's father tells Ruby that she can feel free to take anything she wants from the safe. All of a sudden, Iska's father notices that Ruby is wearing the bracelet. He then adds that he's glad to see that the bracelet ended up with her. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby asks Iska's father for more clarification. Iska's father clarifies that he was worried when Iska took it, but he's glad that he didn't squander it. He adds that despite its humble appearance, the bracelet is a family heirloom. This clarification makes Ruby pause. Ruby then mentions to Iska's father that Iska only told her that it's a bracelet for her health. Iska's father explains to Ruby that his grandfather had this bracelet crafted from a cave dragon's heart. Upon hearing this explanation, Ruby is shocked and couldn't believe that the bracelet was made out of a dragon's heart. Ruby then realizes that the jewels on the bracelet were fragments of a dragon's heart and is a family heirloom. This also makes Ruby wonder if that's the reason why Iski's father was so grumpy at the banquet. Iska's father then states to Ruby that he would like to apologize regarding the banquet. He adds that he made time for it because it was held in her name. But he was upset when he saw the way his son dressed for it. Ruby starts to nod upon hearing this apology and reassures him that it's fine and how there's nothing to apologize for. She adds that, however, she supposes that she'll have to return this bracelet. Iska's father disagrees with Ruby and tells her that it already belongs to her as she's the lady of this house. He also asks Ruby about how she feels about her life here, as this can be quite a dull place to live. As Ruby is smiling, she replies, D dull? Not at all. I rather find life here far more interesting than in Romana. Upon hearing this response, Iska's father mentions to Ruby that he had thought that she would miss her homeland dearly and how she's always full of surprises. Ruby questions Iska's father if that's true. Iska's father then explains to Ruby that he just assumed that she would frequently visit the temple since she's his holiness's daughter. He adds that he was simply curious since she seems that she doesn't. After all, the Arendil Temple is always ready to help her with anything from adjusting to life in the North to all kinds of trivial matters. Upon hearing this explanation, Ruby wonders if Iska's father is probing to see if she's secretly communicating with the temple. Ruby then states to Iska's father that, to be honest, just hearing hymns makes her drop right to sleep. She also asks him if he prefers her to be more pious. Iska's father clears his throat and responds, Not really, but I was concerned that His Holiness might think we're holding you against your will. Upon hearing this response, Ruby reassures Iska's father that her father wouldn't think like that as he knows that she likes it here. Iska's father is speechless. He then asks Ruby if it's the place she likes, or his son. Ruby replies, I fell in love the moment I saw Iska. Upon hearing this response, Iska's father further questions Ruby about if it was love at first sight or that sort of thing. Ruby confirms with him that this was exactly it. Iska's father asks her if she really means it. Ruby questions him for more clarification. Iska's father clarifies that he's not questioning her motives. He adds that it's just that her answer reminded her of someone. He couldn't shake the impression that she was in danger. This is why he asked. Upon hearing this clarification, Ruby reassures him that she meant it. Iska's father is speechless at first. He then tells Ruby that he seems to get chatty with old age and requests her to not mind what he just said. As he's leaving Ruby's room, he wishes her to have a good day. We then see the next scene where Ruby is at the tea party. Leah pours some tea for the princess. Upon the princess noticing this, she mentions to Leah that she was supposed to be the princess today. As the other ladies are watching the little girls playing, a lady in brown states to Ruby that she heard that Her Highness likes her and how it seems to be true. She further asks Ruby if she really plays with the princess like how she's playing with Leah. Ruby embarrassingly confirms with the lady that she does. 
As Ruby sips her tea, we learn that the little girls brought their dollhouse and made their little corner here, and they sometimes even let Ruby join their role-playing. The lady in brown then tells Ruby that the garden really is as beautiful as the rumors say. A lady in green also mentions that it must have been so romantic when her husband first gave it to her. Upon hearing these statements, Ruby starts to groan and wonders if she sounds like she's bragging. She also starts to remember how Ellen explained to her that this kind of thing is something that she should brag about. This memory gives Ruby the confidence to brag a little. She decides to play the role of the immature princess. The lady in brown then states that they truly are a lovely couple. Ellen agrees with the lady in brown and adds that they're almost painful to watch when they get all lovey-dovey with each other. Suddenly, Freya puts her teacup down and mentions to everyone that they say people change when they're about to die. She adds that, however, Iske is way too healthy for that. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby starts thinking about how there is never one without the other. Wherever Ellen goes, Ruby knows that Freya will always be there. Ruby is aware that she feels so uncomfortable whenever Freya is around. We then learn that Ruby's been throwing up much less frequently these days, but she still feels repulsed by food. Ruby then starts to wonder why Ellen gave her so many desserts. All of a sudden, someone greets all the ladies. It turns out to be Ivan. Ivan adds that he hopes that they're having a pleasant time. Once the lady in green realizes that it's Ivan, she welcomes him and questions him if he would like to join them for tea. Leah also asks her brother about what he's doing here. Ivan turns around, and as he's poking his sister, he tells her that she's been bugging people here so much lately that he came to pick her up. He also greets the princess. Leah slaps her brother's hand away and reassures him that this is not true. She adds that she promised to play with the princess and questions Ivan about why doesn't he go home first. Upon hearing this conversation, Ellen shrugs her shoulders and mentions to Ivan that him and his sister are as close as ever. Ivan starts to laugh upon hearing Ellen's statement and states to her that he doesn't think so. He adds that, however, if she says so, then that must be the case indeed. Upon seeing Ivan's reaction, Ruby realizes that coming here to pick up Leah was just an excuse for Ivan. The princess then tells Leah that she thinks she should be going home too. Leah gasps as she can't believe it and asks the princess why. The princess responds, It's getting late, and Sir Ivan is already here to take you home as well. Upon hearing this response, Ivan mentions to his sister that the princess is heading home, so they should go too. As the princess is leaving, she reassures Ruby that she'll come by to play again with her. Ruby agrees with the princess and states that she'll see her out. However, Ellen rises and tells Ruby not to get up, as she shall escort the princess. The other ladies also decide to leave with Ivan. As they are walking away, the ladies start to talk to Ivan regarding the gladiator tournament. This makes Ruby realize that Ivan is pretty popular as well with the ladies. Suddenly, Ruby starts to search her surroundings as she remembers that the little girls always leave something behind whenever they leave. She then notices a hairpin on the ground. Once she picks it up, she decides to give it to the little girls the next time they come by. All of a sudden, Freya comments on how adorable the hairpin is. This causes Ruby to jolt. Freya adds that she used to play in dollhouses when she was little too. However, it wasn't anything as fancy as this one. Ruby mentions to Freya that she understands. Freya then turns around, and as she's looking around the garden, she states that the garden is truly magnificent. She also confirms with Ruby if Iske designed it himself. Ruby confirms with her that he did. She also starts to think about how Freya is tiring her out already. As Freya is turning back around to face Ruby, she questions Ruby if she's satisfied now. Ruby asks Freya more clarification. Freya clarifies that it's a simple question. As Freya grabs her teacup, she asks Ruby again if she's satisfied now. Freya continues by mumbling if that question is too hard for her. She further questions Ruby if she's happy. Ruby replies by asking Freya why she's asking her that all of a sudden. She also starts to wonder what she's trying to say this time. Freya responds, I was just wondering since Iska loves you so much, from my experience, people like you are easily satisfied in life regardless of who their partner is, as long as their safety is secured. 
And of course, you're no exception. Upon hearing this response, Ruby questions Freya for more clarification. Freya clarifies that what she's saying is that she'd probably feel just as satisfied even if she were to marry someone else, someplace far from here. Ruby states to Freya that this is a strange thing to suggest as she has no desire to leave Iski at all. Freya snickers and asks Ruby if she really doesn't understand. As she laughs, she adds that perhaps she's pretending not to. Ruby questions Freya about how is she supposed to understand her if she keeps beating around the bush like this. As Freya is walking towards Ruby, she replies, Ruby, Iska is His Majesty's favorite nephew, the one who succeeds the royal bloodline of Britannia. That means Iska is more likely to take the throne than the young princess who has heathen blood in her. Surely even you could understand that, right? Freya adds that if Iska inherits the throne, then his partner will greatly affect the fate of the North. This response shocks Ruby. Freya then questions Ruby about if they will continue to suffer under the intervention of the corrupt believers, or will they rise beyond their grasp and make them cower before them? As Freya is shrugging, she also asks Ruby about what do the corrupt priests of the South know about these lands anyway. Even if she thinks of this place as nothing more than a playground with some fascinating creatures, Freya further states to Ruby that she may not easily understand what she's saying right now, and she doesn't necessarily need her to, either. She adds that she's just warning her in advance so that she won't feel hurt and resent her later. Ruby questions Freya for an explanation. Freya explains that one's first love is a powerful thing indeed, and she certainly is a lovely creature just like a pretty dancing doll, if she may say so. As Freya's plucking the leaves of one of the flowers, she adds that when a man like Iska meets someone like her, he is sure to lose all logic and reason just because it's his first love. But in reality, it's nothing more than a brief encounter. Upon hearing this explanation, Ruby agrees with Freya in her head, as she's aware that she knows that much. Ruby also knows that people can change at any moment. She knows this so well because she's experienced it firsthand. She further wonders how that's any of Freya's concern. Ruby then tells Freya that she just noticed that she speaks as though she knows quite a lot about her husband. Freya asks Ruby about if she made her feel uncomfortable. Ruby responds, Ha! Hardly. I just found it amusing, that's all. You did say I might end up resenting you, but actually, Iska has never mentioned you to me at all. Freya starts to laugh very loudly upon hearing this response and mentions to Ruby that this is Iska's way of looking after her. She adds that he's worried she might see her as a love rival. As Freya is brushing her hair, she states to Ruby to make no mistake as she has no interest in playing around with people's feelings, and neither does Iska. She adds that Iski and her have always shared many common interests ever since they were little, and one of them is their love for the North. Freya also questions Ruby about how Iska might enjoy the occasional spring breeze, but why would he give his heart to a breeze that would soon blow away? In the end, he'll know whom he must choose for the sake of his loved ones and for the glory of the North. Upon hearing this response, Ruby realizes that essentially what Freya is saying is that she doesn't deserve to be with Iska. Meanwhile, she'll make a suitable queen by Iski's side when he becomes king. As Ruby clenches her hand, she wonders why Freya has to sound so pompous and pretentious in saying that. Ruby thinks that it's pathetic as Freya's just desperately baiting her with her words to conceal how she feels. Ruby then says, Lady Freya, the things you say don't add up. Upon hearing this statement, Freya asks her for more clarification. As Ruby steps closer towards Freya, she clarifies that she said that she'll be easily satisfied once her safety is guaranteed, regardless of whether she's with Iska or not. She also questions Freya about if that's the case, then why would she say she'll be hurt by Iska or even think of her as a love rival? She further asks Freya if it's perhaps since she's anxious that she might lose Iska forever. Freya flicks her hair and replies, Seriously, you say the most preposterous things while pretending to be so sweet. Well, not hard to see what makes you feel so confident. After all, Iska isn't the only one being so nice to you lately. Freya adds that even Ellen said that she constantly feels worried about her, or something like that. She must admit that it surprised her because Ellen hates mindless fools just as much as she does. 
Freya then leans towards Ruby and states that, however, she should let her take this opportunity to teach her something. As she's grinning, she adds that too much confidence will only bring her harm. Suddenly, Freya drops all of the tea on herself. Ruby is shocked upon noticing this. As Ruby is about to question Freya about what she's doing, the two of them start to hear Ivan, Leah, and the princess walking back towards them to find Leah's hairpin. We also see that Ellen and the other ladies are coming back with them as well. They all notice Freya dripping in tea and are confused. As they huddle around her, they ask Freya what happened, how did it happen, and if she's all right. Freya responds, Oh, I'm fine, but I think Ruby seems to have slightly misunderstood something I said. Ellen asks Freya for more clarification. She also requests Ruby to tell them what happened, which makes Ruby flinch. The guests further confirm with Freya about if Ruby really did this to her. Upon hearing this, Ruby starts thinking about how it's the same pattern all over again. As she clenches the hairpin in her hand, Ruby knows that Freya is playing the victim while she's being identified as the villainess who harasses her husband's friend out of jealousy. Ellen then requests Ruby to say something. Ruby turns towards Ellen. Ellen notices that Ruby is very serious and sad. Leah also starts to get teary-eyed and questions her brother about if they had a fight over her hairpin. She further asks her brother about if they both want her hairpin. Ivan reassures his sister that of course that's not the case and how she shouldn't act silly. Ellen then states that she's sure Ruby must have had a reason and asks her again if she can tell them what happened. Ruby is speechless upon hearing this question, which makes Ivan sigh. Ellen then requests Ruby to say something again. However, this time Freya stops her and tells her that it seems Ruby is shocked. She adds that she doesn't want this to get out of hand. Suddenly, Ruby interrupts Freya and mentions to everyone how this is not her doing. She adds that she didn't do anything at all, neither this time nor any time before. Upon hearing this response, the ladies mention to Ruby that this is ridiculous and question her about if she's saying that Freya did this to herself. Freya also agrees with Ruby. As she's trembling, Freya adds that she made her angry, so it's only right that she is punished for it. Ellen then notices that Freya is quivering and states to Freya that they should get her inside first so that she can change her clothes. As everyone is leaving, Freya takes a quick glance back at Ruby and tells her that it seems like they'll have to end their afternoon tea here. As Ruby is walking back to her room, she realizes what Freya is trying to tell her. She knows now that it doesn't matter how hard she tries to fit in. She'll always be no more than an outsider here. Ruby also wonders if this is how she will end up being discarded once again. She further mentions to herself that this is silly of her as she should be used to this by now. All of a sudden, one of Ruby's maids calls out to her. As she's rushing over to her, she asks Ruby if she enjoyed the tea party. She adds that she was just about to start preparing her dinner. Suddenly, the maid comes to a halt as she notices that Ruby's sad. She then questions Ruby about what happened. Ruby states to the maid that nothing happened. The maid tells Ruby that this isn't true since she's crying and she seems so sad. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby flops onto the maid and starts to weep. The maid feels sorry for Ruby and starts to calm Ruby down. We then transition to the next scene where we see Iska slaying a monster. Once he is done slaying the monster, he starts to remember what Ruby told him before about how this is where her friends are, where he is, and how she wants to spend her whole life with him here. One of the other knights then asks Iske what they are doing here as all the other guys are taking a break. He further questions Iske about if he's worried that the other knights might kill his wife's monster friends if they spot them. As the knight shakes his head, he reassures Iska that demonic creatures can survive the wild and how they'll manage. He adds that he remembers that he never cared about demonic creatures anyway. Iske mentions to the knight that he's quite the chatterbox today. He adds that he never asked him to come. This statement triggers the knight. He then shouts at Iske by stating that he came along because he was worried that he might die of exhaustion. The knight adds that at least the frost dragon is still in hiding. If it weren't, then the kingdom would push them to capture it so that they could use it for the gladiatorial tournament.
However, if it even crawls out of hiding and attacks a village, then they will have to bring it down. The knight further asks Iska if he's really entering the gladiatorial tournament. Iska questions the knight about why he's asking this and if he's worried that he might win again. The knight replies, That's some nice bullshit. It doesn't make any sense. You're doing all these things to keep these monsters alive. So why would you join tournaments where you'll have to kill them? All of a sudden, the red-haired knight comes out of nowhere and tells Iski that it worries him as well. He also questions Iski about if Ruby understands their cries. Would she be all right seeing him hunting them down? And what if the monsters do something unexpected when they see her? Iski responds, That's precisely why I must join the tournament. For now, we don't understand Ruby's connection with demonic monsters, or whether all of them respond to her in the same way. But we can't keep her away from the stands either, since Cardinal Valentino will be present to oversee the committee. As Iska slashes another monster that tries to ambush him from the bushes, he adds that this is why he has to be there, so that he can prevent the monsters from trying anything on Ruby and to kill them without making them suffer. Upon hearing this response, the white-haired knight asks him what he would do if he loses. Iska reassures the white-haired knight that he won't lose. He will show a glorious win and make his uncle proud. As Iske's grinning, he adds that he has the justification to do as he sees fit. He further mentions to the knights to call it a day and head back. Upon hearing this response, the knights think that Iska is a puffed-up jerk. One of Ruby's maids serves her food in a tray. Ruby believes that Ellen must have told the maid to serve it to her in her room since she had stayed in her room and skipped dinner. Ruby knew she would throw up the food, but she had it anyways. Ruby feels so depressed that she doesn't even feel like blaming Freya. She believes that she is nothing compared to the influence that Freya has here. This is why she feels like it doesn't matter what she says since everyone would take Freya's side at the end. Ruby also thinks that Freya is the female lead after all and not her so Ezek won't be any different. A part of Ruby's heart aches even though she knows everything better than anyone. She further regrets that she let herself believe that she was trying to fit in, even if it was for a second. Ruby then calls out to the two maids. The maids respond, Yes, my lady. Ruby orders them to take the rest of the evening off because she wants to take a walk in the greenhouse by herself. The maids kindly ask Ruby if they could at least prepare the bath for her. Ruby is surprised at first from this question. She then starts to look down in sadness and states that she will take care of that herself for today. The maids look at each other in shock and reply with, Yes, my lady? We then transition to the next scene where we see Ruby walking in the greenhouse. Ruby starts to feel a burning sensation in her chest as she puts her hand on her chest. She believes that it's because she hasn't thrown up in a while. Ruby has been trying so hard to retrain herself. Ruby then looks to her side and mentions to herself that she always wanted to sit on a boat here with Ellen. As Ruby sits on the ground, she wonders what Ellen thinks of her now. She also guesses that Ellen probably regrets becoming closer to her now. She further starts to think about how close she had become with Ellen and Ivan and how she finally had someone that she felt comfortable around. Ruby then slumps down by hugging her knees and putting her head onto them in sadness. She also says, How pathetic of me. I shouldn't have hoped for something I don't deserve. Ruby further starts to recall Freya saying that Isaac is sure to lose all logic and reason just because it's his first love. Upon remembering this, Ruby states to herself that it may only have been a passing whim. Ruby then starts to remember all of the romantic moments that she had recently with Azik and how he told her that he loved her. Upon remembering these moments, Ruby mentions to herself that she's well aware of that too. She also hopes that Isaac won't be so mad at her if she acts truly sorry for what happened, even though he might not feel any affection for her anymore. All of a sudden, the head maid approaches Ruby and says, There you are, Lady Rudbeckia. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby glances over to see who approached her. She realizes that it's the headmaid. The headmaid then adds that Ellen told her to check to see if she had finished her meal. Ruby is speechless upon hearing this statement. She also thinks about how the headmaid could have easily asked her maids Ronia or Lucille. The headmaid then states to Ruby that if she may be so bold as to speak her mind, 
She's looked after Ellen since she was a baby. She adds that this is why Ellen often confides in her about her secrets. The headmaid further tells Ruby that she's sure that Ellen told her secret to change her perception about her. She adds that, however, she has always known it. Upon hearing these statements, Ruby guesses that Ellen must have told the head maid about her anorexia. As Ruby is aware that, after all, Ellen relies on the head maid more than she ever did on her own mother. Ruby continues to think about how Ellen did seem to tell the head maid without any malicious intent. But it doesn't really matter to Ruby, as long as Ellen doesn't tell Isaac. Ruby further believes that the head maid seems to have taken the secret in a very different way than from what Ellen had intended. The headmaid then mentions to Ruby that she has heard that Ellen has told her about how the late Duchess passed away. She adds that she will never understand how much Ellen had to suffer because of the late Duchess. Ruby is surprised upon hearing this statement. As the headmaid clenches her hand, she continues by stating that she will not let anyone make Ellen go through the same pain again. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby starts to think about how she always assumed that the headmaid would pity the late Duchess since she was probably in the Duchess's inner circle. She further wonders, why would the headmaid say something like that? And if this is how much the headmaid cares for Ellen? The headmaid then states to Ruby that she seems to take after the Duchess's peculiar habit, as well as her way of causing all sorts of trouble for Ellen. The headmaid adds that she's starting to wonder if a curse is afflicting the mistresses of the house. This statement shocks Ruby. The headmaid then continues by telling Ruby that she has yet to leave them. However, Ruby interrupts the headmaid by suddenly rising up and questioning her about why she has to leave and where should she go. The headmaid nervously replies, you know it better than anyone, my lady. You would gladly leave this castle any time. However, Ruby interrupts the headmaid again by mentioning to her not at all. She adds that she's not leaving this place, not even after she's dead. Upon hearing this statement, the headmaid starts to walk closer to Ruby and asks her if the first love is indeed like a sweet dream of sorts. The headmaid adds that she understands why she would feel this way. However, she will soon come to realize that everyone has a place where they belong. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby starts to wonder about why people keep framing everything they weigh they like just to preach their sermons at her. She also wonders if they just want her to get lost, and if that's all they have to say. Ruby is aware that she chose this place so she could survive, and that's all she ever did. She further wonders why everyone is so desperate to bite her head off. Suddenly, Ruby's expression changes into anger. As she's clenching her hand, the headmaid mentions to Ruby that she is giving this advice to her for her own sake. However, Ruby interrupts the headmaid by slapping her across the face, causing the headmaid's glasses to drop on the grass. Meanwhile, we see Ellen walking outside and thinking about how Ruby stated that she didn't do anything to Freya, neither this time nor any time before. Freya sighs upon remembering this. Suddenly, someone asks Ellen why she's outside since it's cold out here. Ellen turns to see who it is and realizes that it's Isaac. Isaac continues by questioning Ellen about how the tea party went and how Ruby is. Ellen turns her head and is speechless upon hearing this question. Isaac becomes confused and asks his sister why she's making that face. Ellen replies, well, at the tea party, Ruby and Freya. We then transition back to the scene where Ruby slapped the headmaid. The headmaid starts to question Ruby about what has she done. However, Ruby interrupts her and asks her what the matter is. She further confirms with the headmaid about if this is how she wanted her to act. The headmaid responds, Oh, -ho, after all that time pretending to be weak and helpless, you finally show your true colors. The head adds that she'll tell Ellen. However, before she's able to finish her statement, Ruby interrupts the headmaid and tells her that she can go and tell Ellen this instant, as it won't change a single thing. She adds that here's something she should always remember. She's just a headmaid, but she's the daughter of Romana's Pope. This makes the headmaid flinch. Ruby further mentions to the headmaid that she should be grateful that she's not having her tongue pulled out. She adds that she's letting her off this time for Ellen's sake. Upon hearing these statements, the headmaid starts to feel nervous. She then grits her teeth, turns around, and starts dashing away. As the headmaid is leaving, 
Ruby believes that this incident will probably damage her relationship with Ellen for good. She further thinks that true friendship is a luxury that she can't afford and how she was a fool to expect something like that, even for a brief moment. We then transition to the next scene where we see Izik calling out to Ruby in her room. As Isaac starts walking into the room, the maids notice him and state that Ruby went out for a walk. Isaac questions the maids about where did she go. The maid tells Isaac that she went to the greenhouse that he made for her. However, before the maid is able to finish her sentence, Isaac leaves the room. The maid is surprised to see this and realizes that Isaac sure is quick. We then see Isaac in the greenhouse and is searching for Ruby everywhere as he's calling out to her. As Isaac is searching for Ruby, he couldn't believe that this is happening. He thought he's finally managed to reach her. He also wonders if he was mistaken, and she left without telling him anything. He further wonders if he said something wrong because of some delusion, and if that's the reason she's trying to leave him again. This is what scares him. All of a sudden, Isaac hears a splash which causes him to freeze. He then turns around and realizes that it's Ruby. He starts to approach Ruby. Once he sees her, he takes a breath of relief. He also asks Ruby what she's doing here. Ruby gasps upon hearing this question and screams out Isaac's name. She further mentions to Isaac that he startled her and how he's back. Isaac questions her about if she was playing hide-and-seek. Ruby confirms with him that she was and how he found her. Isaac asks her what his reward is. Ruby questions him for more clarification. As Eyes grabs Ruby's hand, he clarifies by confirming with Ruby about if he found her. This confirmation makes Ruby pause. She also asks Isaac if her lips would be okay as the reward. Isaac blushes upon hearing this question and slightly chuckles. He then leans towards Ruby and says, That'll do. Ruby then gets on her typey toes and kisses Isaac. As they are kissing, Ruby wonders about if anyone told Isaac anything yet or if he's testing her. Once they stop kissing, Ruby starts to think about how whichever it is. If this is to be their last kiss, then she'll be very sad. Suddenly, Isaac flinches as he notices Ruby crying. Eyes asks Ruby what's wrong. Ruby replies, you already heard all about it, didn't you, Iz? This response makes Isaac flinch. Ruby adds that she knows that he won't believe her, no matter what she tells him. But the truth is that she never did anything, neither then nor now. Ruby further tells Isaac that she's not lying about any of this, but she's sure that the incident will have made him lose trust in her. She adds that it's all her fault. Upon hearing these statements, Isaac mentions to Ruby that this is not true. He also requests her to look at him. Ruby states to Isaac that she was wrong to wish for something she doesn't deserve. However, Isaac interrupts Ruby by questioning her about if she really doesn't want to see him anymore. Ruby pauses upon hearing this question. She then shakes her head in disagreement. She also tells Isaac that she keeps causing trouble here, so she thought he'd try to send her back again. Isaac asks her for an explanation. Ruby explains that he said that he hates her and finds her irritating. That's why she tried her best not to do anything he doesn't approve of. So, it's all her fault. Isaac reassures Ruby that it isn't her fault. He explains to her that at the time, he thought sending her back to Romana was the best way to keep her safe. He also thought that returning to Romana would only become more heartbreaking once she'd grown fond of this place, and the longer he tried to keep her here. Isaac further explains to Ruby that this is why he blurted out something he never meant at all, and how that was his fault. Upon hearing this explanation, Ruby mentions to Izik that she knows he has feelings for someone else. She adds that he doesn't have to come up with excuses and how she's really fine. So he should just go to Freya now. This statement shocks Izek and is speechless. He then lifts Ruby's hand and holds it. He also states to Ruby that it wasn't Freya who worried him at that time. As he puts Ruby's hand on his heart, he adds that the person he felt concerned for was always her. Izek clarifies that he had to quickly push her away because demonic monsters would swarm at her once she was splashed with the blood affected by mystical crystals. He had to do something so she wouldn't get hurt. Isaac then grabs Ruby to hug her and says, of course, I know it all sounds like a pathetic excuse. He also apologizes to Ruby as he's hugging her. He adds that he shouldn't have done that, not matter what his reason was. He further apologizes to Ruby for hurting her. 
Upon hearing this apology, Ruby clenches her hand and starts crying even more. She also tells Isaac that it wasn't her. Isaac mentions to her that he knows. As Ruby starts to hit Isaac, she states that she really didn't do it. Isaac reassures Ruby that he knows that. As Ruby continues to hit Isaac, she questions him about what did she ever do and why does everyone always try to blame her. Upon hearing these questions, Isaac starts thinking about how there was only truth in Ruby's eyes and warmth in her embrace, leaving him to dread how he'd ever live with himself if Ruby were to leave him. Isaac also knows that this is because she's the only one who makes him desire something beyond what he deserves. We then transition to the next scene where we see Ruby and Isaac sitting by the fireplace and are having tea and snacks. Isaac then passes tea over to Ruby and tells her to try it. Ruby takes a sip of the tea and then glances at Isaac. She also nervously calls out to him. Isaac asks her what's wrong. Ruby questions Isaac out if he's all right and mentions that she shouldn't have hit him so hard. Isaac reassures her that he barely felt it. He then grabs Ruby's hand and adds that, in fact, he was worried that it might bruise her hands. Isaac then kisses Ruby's hand and starts to stroke it. This action makes Ruby start to blush. She then quickly pulls her hand back and asks Isaac about what he's drinking. Isaac states that it's just some rum. Ruby questions him if she can try it. Upon hearing this question, Isaac slides it towards Ruby. Ruby grabs the drink and starts to gulp it down. Isaac is surprised upon seeing this. As Ruby is gulping it down, she starts to wonder what the dreadful taste is. Isaac also starts to laugh upon seeing Ruby's reaction. As Isaac pours the rum into Ruby's tea, he tells her that it's not so bad when you use it just for the aroma. He also asks Ruby if she wants to give it another chance. Ruby sips her tea and is amazed by the taste this time. Isaac then mentions to Ruby that she can let the butler know if there's any particular liquor she likes. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby states to Isaac that it wasn't really about the liquor. Isaac questions her for more clarification. Ruby clarifies that she just wanted to know what he drinks. She further asks him how his day was as she wanted to ask that too. Isaac responds, it was slow. We just killed a few goblins. However, as Isaac is telling Ruby about his day, she starts to remember all of the things that Freya told her at the tea party earlier. Suddenly, Isaac asks Ruby about what else would she like to know. Ruby blinks upon hearing this question and questions Isaac for more clarification. Isaac clarifies that she's been staring at him for some time now. Isaac further asks Ruby if there's anything that she'd like to tell him. Ruby starts to wonder if Isaac will trust her if she tells him everything. As she's fidgeting, she also wonders if he would trust her over Freya. Ruby feels scared and further wonders if this will ruin everything that they've managed to build and will cause them to have to start all over again. Ruby then says, and no, there isn't anything in particular. Oh, but everyone's talking about the tournament. Will you be joining the gladiatorial tournament as well? Isaac is speechless at first. Afterwards, he asks Ruby why she asked this question and if she would rather have him not participate. Ruby nervously tells Ezek that this isn't the reason why she asked. Ezek then mentions to Ruby that demonic monsters in the tournament aren't like her friends. Ruby states that she understands, which is why she's all the more worried for his safety. She adds that, of course, he's a top holy knight who has even previously won the tournament. Upon hearing this statement, Isaac stops drinking his rum and tells Ruby that he just doesn't want her to feel hurt. This statement surprises Ruby and makes her question Isaac for more clarification. Isaac mentions to her never mind, and as he slides over some cookies, he asks Ruby if she wants to try this too. As Isaac puts his glass of rum down, he also requests Ruby to bear with him just this once. He adds that he knows it can't be easy for her to watch demonic monster die. If she has to be in the stands and there's nothing he can do about it, then he intends to end the tournament as quickly as possible. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby wonders why Isaac is telling her these things as she understands that not all demonic monsters are like her friends. Isaac then mentions to Ruby that if he wins this tournament and gives her the flower of glory, then no one will ever harass her again. Ruby starts to blush upon hearing this statement, and she wonders if Isaac is risking his life to participate in the tournament over something like that. 
she also wonders if he's doing all this for her sake. This further makes Ruby realize why Isaac tried to keep her far from any demonic monsters and why he was so furious when his colleagues took her along to find a pack of frost wolves. Ruby now realizes that Isaac was always worried for her. Ruby then starts to nervously tell Isaac about what happened at the tea party. As she's telling him, she starts to think about how she hates, how she always tries to check for his approval, even in this moment. Ruby then says, actually, Lady Freya poured the tea on herself, saying she'd teach me a lesson. And the reason I slapped the headmaid back at the Garden of Water was because she said something similar to me. Ruby adds that she's sorry for causing so much trouble. However, Isaac mentions to her to wait and hold on, which causes Ruby to flinch. As Isaac holds Ruby's hand, he adds that she doesn't have to rush and to just tell him everything from the start. Ruby then states that it seems Freya thought she was arrogant. She adds that Freya told her too much confidence is harmful, and then poured tea on her head. Upon hearing this statement, Isaac interrupts Ruby and tells her that she's still rushing to tell him how it all ended. He adds to focus on herself, and not to think about anything else since no one matters to him more than her. He further requests Ruby to take her time to tell him everything and what they said to her. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby realizes that she only has to tell Isaac about what happened, but she can't even do that. Ruby knows that she's already built a habit of blurting things out right away in fear that someone could suddenly get mad at her when she's telling a story. Ruby then asks Isaac if she really is that important to him. Will he grant her one wish? Isaac reassures Ruby that he will and questions her about why wouldn't he. Ruby responds by requesting Isaac not to get sick of her. This response causes Isaac grit his teeth. He also slumps down and asks Ruby what kind of a wish is that. Ruby replies, everyone tells me that your love is only fleeting and that you will eventually get tired of me. Upon hearing this response, Isaac questions Ruby about if she's telling him that Freya and the headmaid said that kind of nonsense to her. Ruby has no response to this question. Isaac then sighs and adds that they're out of their minds. He also wonders how they dared to say such things to her. Isaac further asks Ruby if this is why she asked him for that wish because of what they said. Ruby responds, I didn't want to believe them. But there aren't many things I know about you, although they've known you for a very long time. They kept telling me things like that. I just couldn't be secure about how you feel about me. Upon hearing this response, as Ezek starts standing up, he questions Ruby about what can he do to make her feel secure. He also kneels down and asks Ruby if she would feel secure if he brings her the heads of those who dared utter that nonsense to her. Ruby is caught off guard upon hearing this question. She then disagrees with Isaac and states that he will get in trouble. She adds that he doesn't need to do something like that, just for her. Isaac asks her if she thinks a husband ought to fight for his wife's honor. Ruby replies back by questioning him about what if it makes families turn on each other and a civil war breaks out. Isaac responds, it doesn't matter. People who utter outrageous things about you have no need to stay alive. He adds that he will do anything if only it can make her life easier. As he holds Ruby's hand, he further requests her to tell him what he needs to do so that she won't have to hide away and cry alone. Upon hearing this request, Ruby starts to cry and tells Ezek that it's because of her and how she's the problem. Ruby adds that he makes her so happy. She feels like she's living in a dream and she just gets anxious that she might ruin everything. Ruby further apologizes to Ezek for being such a mess. Ruby then starts to think about how she never imagined that the red twilight painting of the autumn skies would shine its light on her. She believes this because she knows that she was abandoned by her own parents, who toiled to bring her into this world, a cursed soul that no one would ever welcome. Ruby also knows that she was born into a world that never wanted her to live. However, she refused to die so that she can prove her reason for being. Even if the fate that lies ahead is an endless path of thorns that tears her skin and stains the fields with her blood. However, Ruby is aware that whenever she is with Ezek, even someone like her can hold hope in her heart because he is the only one who accepts her as she is. Ruby then thanks Isaac for believing her. She adds that she really means it as she continues to cry. 
Ruby starts thinking about how even if Isaac were to stop wanting her one day and withdraws the warmth he'd once given her, then every moment that they shared together will forever remain etched in her soul. Isaac then starts to brush Ruby's tears away and reassures her that of course he believes her because he's always on her side. Upon hearing this reassurance, Ruby wonders what she did to deserve Isaac and the affection in his eyes. Ruby then holds Isaac's hand and asks him that if she ever does something truly terrible, will he still be on her side? Then Isaac bumps his head with Ruby's head and replies, well then, I guess I'd just become an accomplice, since a couple should always be together. Ruby smiles upon hearing this response and mentions to Isaac that he's spoiling her. Isaac smiles as well and disagrees with Ruby. He adds that she's not nearly spoiled enough yet. As Ruby goes in to kiss Isaac, she doesn't know if this is okay or why Isaac doesn't question her at all. But right now, she just wants to focus on his eyes as he gazes into hers. This also decides to fill his eyes with the sweet fantasy that Ruby gave him, so that she can tell him that something magical can happen for him as well. Meanwhile, we see Ellen looking out of the window. Ellen starts to remember the conversation she had with Freya where Freya mentioned to Ellen that she merely told Ruby about the kinds of games they played when they were little. She added that Ruby must have misunderstood what she said. She further stated that Ruby suddenly got mad at her and poured tea over her. However, Ellen wondered what Ruby misunderstood. Ellen knows that Freya is her friend and that she can tell her anything. Likewise, she believes that she should be able to trust anything that Freya tells her. However, Ellen wonders why she feels like everything is so foggy and obscure. She also wonders what Ruby was so afraid of. She can't think of anything that would have frightened Ruby here. Ellen further wonders why Freya is telling her all of these excuses. Ellen believes that the Freya she knows would have simply laughed this off. She also feels like something is off, as though so someone is trying to force the wrong piece into a puzzle. Ellen then starts to compare her mother and Ruby. She knows that they both have compulsions about food and have a somewhat unstable side. But despite their similarities, Ellen believes that she can never understand the sentiments that they hold deep in their hearts. We then learn that Ellen didn't think much of Ruby when she first met her. However, if it hadn't been for her, Ellen would have been forced into a marriage and sent to a foreign land. So all Ellen felt was a bit of relief for herself and sympathy for Ruby. She knew Ruby was dear to the Pope, so she thought it would only be a matter of time until Ruby left them. Suddenly, the butler interrupts Ellen's thoughts. Ellen turns around and questions the butler about what brings him here so early in the morning. The butler apologizes and then mentions something about a Zeke, which catches her attention. We then transition to the next scene where we see Ellen running to where Isaac is. All of a sudden, Ellen stops running as she sees Isaac pointing his sword towards someone. She then calls out Isaac's name in confusion and shock as she realizes that Isaac is pointing his sword at the headmaid who's bowing in front of him. We see a flashback where Ellen's mother is blaming Ellen for changing her father. The headmaid is also trying to calm Ellen's mother and requesting her not to shout. Ellen's mother then says, I should have never given birth to the likes of you. This statement stuns Ellen. As the headmaid looks back at Ellen, Ellen's mother demands the headmaid to let go of her this instant. She further scratches the headmaid on the cheeks and tells her to get out of here. The headmaid continues to request Ellen's mother to calm down and requested her not to do this. However, Ellen's mother ignores her and states to the headmaid to get her hands off of her. Suddenly, Ellen's mother trips by the carpet on the ground and falls to the ground. Ellen tries to reach out to her mother, but the headmaid dashes towards Ellen to protect her and mentions to Ellen's mother that she thought she had gotten better. She adds that, however, it seems she has misread the signs in her foolishness. As Ellen's mother is rising from the ground, the headmaid further states that if she truly cares about Ellen, then she will not think of seeing her ever again. Meanwhile, Ellen is trembling and quivering as she's hugging the headmaid. The headmaid then rushes away from Ellen's mother. As the headmaid is running away, Ellen's mother shouts out, Mum, my baby, I'm sorry, my darling. Once the headmaid is outside of the room, she slams the door shut behind her. 
She also reassures Ellen not to worry as she's patting her to calm her down. The headmaid adds that her mother is just unwell for a short while, and no matter what happens, she swears to protect her with her life. Ellen starts to cry upon hearing this reassurance. Ellen knew that she was too young to cope with her mother's condition at the time. She also knew that she had no one to lean on, but the headmaid was always there to lend her embrace. We then transition back to the present, where Ellen is seeing the headmaid kneeling before her eyes once again. Ellen then questions the headmaid about what's going on here. Isaac mentions to the headmaid to tell Ellen what she did. The headmaid apologizes and states that she felt concerned about Ruby, so she merely spoke to her about her habits. This response causes Ellen to flinch. The headmaid then adds that, as Ruby is married to the heir of his grace, Duke Omerta, she told her she should try to break some of those bad habits, if only for the sake of her own reputation. As the headmaid is crying, she explains that, however, Ruby suddenly became furious and slapped her across the cheek. Ellen sighs upon hearing this response and starts to believe that it can't be a coincidence since she keeps hearing about Ruby's erratic behavior. She also wonders if Ruby has been hiding her true colors all this time. Isaac then asks the headmaid if she is saying Ruby lied to him. He also confirms with the headmaid about if she never threatened Ruby to leave or told her some nonsense about first love. Upon hearing this statement, Ellen turns towards the headmaid and confirms with her as well. The headmaid replies, I, I wouldn't dare, my lady. That is not what I meant at all. Please believe me, my lady. Upon hearing this response, we learn that Ellen thought that Ruby and the headmaid had merely started off on the wrong foot. She had given Martha a stern warning and even asked her to look after Ruby after she had run away from home. She had trusted that the headmaid would understand what she meant and treat Ruby well. Regardless of what they felt about each other, Ellen wanted them to have a better relationship with the best of intentions. That's why she told the headmaid about the similarities between her mother and Ruby. Isaac then clenches his sword and confirms with the headmaid about if she admits to saying it. He adds that this is all the nonsense he needed to hear. All of a sudden, the butler interrupts Isaac. He apologizes for interrupting him and tells Isaac that the man beside him has something to tell him. Isaac mentions to the mysterious man to speak. The man states to Isaac that he's the new gardener in charge of the glass house. He adds that last night, he dropped by to make an inspection. We then see a flashback where the gardener was warming up the glass house by lighting up some candles. Suddenly, he heard the headmaid call out to Ruby. As he took a glance at the two of them, he heard the headmaid mention to Ruby on how she's starting to wonder if there is a curse afflicting the mistresses of this house. This statement made the gardener question what the headmaid was saying to Ruby. He knew that the headmaid is notorious for her sharp tongue and further wondered how she could dare say such a thing to Ruby. We are then back in the present and the gardener says, I was there and I heard everything. She suggested that the late Duchess and Lady Rudbeckia were cursed and insisted that her ladyship was acting out of line using his lordship's infatuation. Upon hearing this statement, Ellen asks the headmaid about what she was thinking. The gardener then hands over the headmaid's glasses and says, Also, I picked these up in the garden right after her ladyship and the headmaid left. I had to interrupt you and bring this up because I thought Lord Isaac and Lady Elenia should know that the headmaid by no means made those remarks out of concern for Lady Rudbeckia. The headmaid starts to shout, stating that this is not true at all and tries to convince Ellen to believe her. She further points at the gardener and adds that she's not the one telling lies to her and Isaac. It is him. Isaac then says, I can hardly believe that this shameless person has managed to stay in House Omerta for so long. Ellen also starts thinking about how this is clearly her fault. She believes that she is to blame for saying things she shouldn't have, regardless of her intentions. She further believes that the headmaid would never have done this if she hadn't said anything about Ruby. 
Ellen is aware that she can't let the headmaid pay for the price of her mistake and wants to take responsibility for this. Ellen then turns and tells all of the maids and butlers to go back to their posts. This statement startles them. However, Ezek stops them and states that no one leaves. He adds that they should see with their own eyes what happens when they revile the Lady of House Omerta. Ellen jolts up and mentions to Isaac to just listen to her. She adds that it's about Ruby and their mother. This isn't something for the others to hear. Ellen then shouts out the head butler's name. The head butler understands what this means. He then rushes to get all of the maids and butlers out of the room, except for the head maid. Once they are all gone, Isaac tells Ellen that it's not for the others to hear, but somehow the head maids seem to know. He also questions her about if that is why the head maid dared to say such things. Ellen droops and mentions to Isaac that this isn't it. Upon hearing this, Isaac states that in that case, that's all the more reason to be rid of the head maid. Isaac then raises his sword and swings it to slice off the head maid's head. However, Ellen comes in front of the head maid to protect her, which makes Isaac flinch. As Ellen is trembling, she requests Isaac not to do this, as he knows that the head maid is more than just a nanny to her. She adds that she'll make sure that she gets to the bottom of this. Isaac puts his sword down and asks Ellen what will happen with Ruby then. He also questions her about if she is just a wife to him and if that's what she's implying. He adds that insufficient handling of this will only allow the same thing to happen all over again. He further asks Ellen if she has learned that yet. Ellen replies, I know that, okay? What about you then? Do you have any idea why Martha is so dear to me and what my life was like before our mother passed away? What do you know of any of that? We then learn that Ellen's mother genuinely tried to kill her on certain occasions. We also see a scene in the past where Ellen's mother is squeezing Ellen's neck. As she's choking Ellen, she's telling her that she really trusted her, but it looks like she ratted her out. Ellen is coughing and calling out for help. Ellen's mother then screams at Ellen and mentions to her that she's the reason why his grace won't come to see her. Ellen then states to Isaac that she loved her mother, and she really tried to understand her. But no amount of effort helped her make sense of any of it. However, every time their mother tried to kill her, the only person who ever rushed to protect her was the head maid. Isaac then mentions to Ellen that he knew that their mother was suffering from a mental illness. He adds that, of course, it was obvious enough. However, he had no idea that she was in danger from her. He further asks Ellen about why didn't she say anything as he would have tried to help if she had told him. Ellen grits her teeth upon hearing this question and responds, how exactly was I supposed to bring it up? I'd have to tell people about mother's condition before I could ask for help. As she clenches her hand, she also asks Isaac about what if their mother tried to kill herself after word got out. She further questions him about if anything would have changed even if she had told him about it. Ellen then mentions to Isaac that the family was particularly strict with the heir, and father hardly even let the two of them meet. Ellen adds that she was aware of that much. She knew he was being trained as the heir and was always busy. Even mother knew that he was busy, which is why she only ever asked for her. On some days, her mother was so kind, just as she used to remember her. But on other days, she was more frightening than any demonic monster. Ellen then starts to cry and asks Isaac what she was supposed to do and who was there to help her other than the headmaid. As she grabs the headmaid's hand, she adds that the headmaid was the only one who kept her safe. And that's why she cannot let him kill her. Ellen then starts to dash away with the headmaid. Isaac starts to remember a memory from his childhood, where he asked Ellen about a scar on her cheek and if someone is bullying her. Ellen reassured Isaac that of course no one is and how she was just playing with mother, and she just got a scratch. She further told him that it's nothing, so he shouldn't worry about it, and that she's fine. After remembering this memory, Isaac throws his sword to the ground and shouts, Damn it! 
We then transition to the next scene where we see the head maid and Ellen. The head maid hesitantly calls out to Ellen. Ellen responds by asking the head maid why she did it. This causes the head maid to flinch. The head maid then replies, I just didn't want you to feel hurt again, my lady. Ellen questions the head maid about how could she say she did that for her. She adds that if she was concerned about her and Ruby, then she can never say anything like that again about her departed mother. This response surprises the head maid. As Ellen turns around to take a look at the head maid, she further asks her about how could she lie to her. The head maid drops to the ground in shock from seeing Ellen crying. She states to Ellen that it's all her fault and how she's to blame for everything. Ellen clenches her hand and tells the head maid to leave this place at once. The head maid tries to request and promise Ellen something. However, Ellen interrupts the head maid by tossing a suitcase in front of her and mentioning to her that she shall never again set foot in House Omerta. The head maid starts to cry and shouts at Ellen, stating that she can't do this to her. She also requests and begs Ellen to reconsider. The head maid adds that if she gives her another chance, like the other time, then she promises that she shall do anything for her. However, Ellen doesn't listen. She flicks the head maid's hands off of her clothes and starts to walk away from her. As Ellen is leaving the room, the head maid shouts out to her. But Ellen doesn't listen or turn around. Once Ellen is outside of the room, she starts thinking about how Ezek would have killed the head maid in front of everyone. As she's crying and recalling her memories with the head maid, she realizes that she didn't want the head maid to die. Ellen knows that this is the best solution for everyone. We then switch to the next scene, where we see Ellen watching the head maid from the window, leaving House Omerta. Ezek walks into the room where Ellen is watching the head maid leave. He then sits on the couch and tells Ellen that it never occurred to him. He adds that he had no idea that's what she had to go through. Ellen mentions to Isaac that they were too young at the time. Isaac requests Ellen that if she doesn't mind, can he tell her about what she knows about their mother? We then learn from Ellen that their mother had a condition that made her throw up anything she ate. Their mother normally never ate much, but sometimes she'd have unusually large meals. One day, Ellen felt worried and went to their mother's room. That's when she saw their mother forcing herself to throw up everything she had just eaten. She then grabbed Ellen violently and told her that if she ever uttered a word about it, she'd kill her in front of everyone. Isaac sighs upon hearing this and questions Ellen about why didn't she ever bring this up after she passed away. Ellen responds, It was already in the past. I didn't want consolation over what had already happened, and bringing it up wasn't going to change anything. Isaac is speechless upon hearing this response. Ellen then adds that this doesn't mean that she hated their mother the whole time. Now that she's all grown up, the first that she remembers about their mother is how the weariness from her suffering had drained all the life from her eyes. Isaac then says, damn it, and asks Ellen if their father knows. Ellen replies, I couldn't say, I hardly ever got to see him at the time. She adds that one thing is for certain, one can always hide something from their spouse if they really try, no matter how good or bad their relationship may be, just like right now. Isaac is confused upon hearing this statement and questions Ellen for an explanation. Ellen explains that she's talking about Ruby. She adds that Ruby has an eating disorder, much like their mother. Isaac confirms with Ellen if Ruby has been doing much better lately, though. Ellen responds, No. She wouldn't have eaten much at all if we weren't making her eat. Isaac asks Ellen if Ruby was skipping meals due to mild depression and stomach problems. He also questions her if she's saying it's something else. Ellen agrees with Isaac and states that there are faint tooth marks on Ruby's hand and their mother had scars like that on the exact same spot. She adds that only people who habitually force themselves to vomit have that mark. Ellen further explains to Isaac that she just wasn't too sure of it when she saw Ruby's hand for the first time. Isaac droops down upon hearing this explanation and realizes that this is the reason why Ruby was never gaining any weight at all. 
Ellen then requests Ezek to not talk to Ruby about this, as it's not something she can fix overnight. She adds that besides, Ruby also asked her to keep it a secret from him, although here she ended up telling him everything. Isaac asks Ellen why the headmaid knew about this. Ellen replies, That is my fault. Martha knew what Mother went through, so I had hoped she would take better care of Ruby. Isaac tells her that this is foolish. We then learn that in the past, Isaac's father told him that his mother is unwell and how he can't let him be around her at the moment since he is the heir of House Omerta. Isaac's father further reassured him to wait until her mother's health gets better, as it should recover soon. Isaac always resented his father for this. Isaac believes that if it hadn't been for him, then he would have been able to spend more time with his mother. And with some luck, he might have even been able to prevent her death. This is why he blamed his father for everything, thinking that he was blinded by his sentiments. Isaac didn't want to become like his father. He didn't want to live like his father. That's why he had turned down all offers of marriage. He just took one step forward, but that single step started shaking him up. On one hand, he was afraid that he might follow in his father's footsteps. On the other hand, he realized he wouldn't mind being blinded by his emotions because Ruby had become the center of his life. Isaac knows that Ruby used to feel intimidated and watched other people's reactions all the time. The idea of anyone hurting something as fragile as her enraged him, but he believed she was getting better as he saw Ruby's eyes sparkle brighter each time they met. Isaac further wonders how he should start addressing this problem and how long has Ruby been hiding this pain. He can't even bring himself to ask Ruby because he doesn't want to hurt her by asking that question. Isaac now knows that Ruby shares the same pain as his mother, and he's afraid that everything he does might just be a repetition of what his father did. As Isaac sighs again, he believes that finding the root cause is one thing, but the problem around Ruby is a problem as well. Isaac is aware that all of those who have tried to harm Ruby have known them for a very long time. He further starts to recall a memory where he called Ruby a liar and realizes that he should have never said that to Ruby. He further remembers another memory where he overheard Ivan questioning Andy about why he was all beaten up. He wishes that he had realized back then why Andy fought with Lorenzo before any of this happened, as Isaac believes that it would have made things much easier for Ruby than the way it is now. The more Isaac thinks about it, the harder it's getting for him to forgive himself. Ellen then says, Anyway, don't scold Ruby for it. She might get scared if anyone trees to... Suddenly, Isaac interrupts her and mentions that everything will be fine as long as the rest of them keep their mouths shut. Ellen is speechless upon hearing this statement. Isaac further asks Ellen about what did Freya say about the incident at the tea party. Ellen sighs and responds, Why don't you ask her that yourself? Freya happens to be your friend as well. Isaac disagrees with Ellen and states that Freya is her friend. He adds that he gave her the benefit of the doubt since she's her only friend and questions her about who could have known that Freya was no better than a beast. Ellen is slightly surprised upon hearing this question and asks for more clarification. Isaac clarifies that Ruby told him everything. He adds that it was Freya who poured tea on herself. This clarification causes Ellen to flinch. Ellen then tells Isaac that she did think that there was something odd about what Freya said, but they can't just take Ruby's word for it either. Ellen further tries to suggest to Isaac that the three of them should sit down and talk it over. However, Isaac interrupts Ellen and mentions to her that he barely managed to calm Ruby down. He further questions her if she's seriously suggesting that he should sit Ruby down with Freya. Isaac adds that Ruby struggled to tell him these things as it is, and sarcastically states that he's sure that Ruby would be delighted to discuss it with the culprit sitting right across from her. He further tells Ellen that enough nonsense and to deliver this message to Freya, word for word, that she'd better watch her actions. He would gladly march straight to the Marquess's manor and slaughter every last one of them.
he adds that the only reasons he's holding himself back are Ruby and her. Upon hearing this message, Ellen tries to request Isaac to not be irrational about this. However, Isaac interrupts Ellen and mentions to her that the same goes for her. He adds that Ruby is his wife and she is her family. He further questions Ellen about if she's supposed to trust the words of her family over the claims of anyone else. Ellen responds, sure, you're right. Isaac then clenches his fist and is feeling infuriated. He doesn't know who he's angry at or how he should resolve his emotions. His heat is full of thoughts and he feels disgusting. Isaac further believes that it's his fault for failing to notice these things and theirs for treating Ruby this way. Suddenly, Isaac remembers something and states to Ellen that he has a favor to ask her. Ellen is surprised upon hearing this and questions Isaac about the favor. We see a scene where Ellen is standing outside of a room. She starts to remember a memory about when she asked Isaac about what kind of favor he needed from her. Isaac replied, When the gladiatorial tournament begins, our holy in-laws will visit Arendelle, but I'll be too busy participating in the matches. I'd like you to keep your eyes on her for me. Ellen questioned Isaac if he's asking her to keep watch over Ruby. Isaac stated that he's talking about everyone from Ruby's family who approaches her, especially Cardinal Valentino. As Isaac was rising, Ellen asked her brother for an explanation. Isaac told her that he will explain later. He also paused and mentioned to Ellen that Ruby said she wanted to apologize to her. She seemed sorry about hurting the nanny, even though it was the headmaid who was insolent to her. Upon hearing this statement, Ellen thought that she should be the one who should be apologizing to Ruby. Isaac then stated to Ellen that he's counting on her for the gladiatorial tournament. As he opened the door to go outside, he also apologized to his sister. This apology made Ellen shudder. She also questioned her brother about what's wrong with him and why is he apologizing? Isaac responded, I feel sorry about a lot of things, that's why. We are then back in the present. As Ellen grasps the door handle, she starts to think about how what she did harmed Ruby, so she should be the one to apologize to her. However, Ellen knows that she's also hurt Ruby too many times, which is why she can't muster the courage to see her. The problem that she's having is that she's not fully convinced about Freya. Ellen wonders if perhaps she's the only one trying to deny what happened. She also wonders what would happen if she says something wrong because of her doubts. Suddenly, one of Ruby's maids calls out to Ellen and asks her if she's here to see Ruby. Ellen halts and replies, No, I was just passing by, that's all. Ellen then turns and swiftly walks away, leaving Ruby's maid puzzled. We then switch to the next scene where we see the same maid knock on Ruby's room door and enter. Ruby notices the maid upon her entering and questions her about what does she think of how she looks. The maid responds, My goodness, I thought you were a fairy, my lady. You look so lovely. Upon hearing this response, Ruby thanks the maid for her compliments. The maid then tells Ruby that Isaac is so romantic since she received so many gifts. She adds that he must love her very, very much. This statement makes Ruby blush. All of a sudden, Ruby jumps up and wonders what she was thinking and how she needs to thank him for the gifts. As she starts to leave, she mentions to her maids that she's going to go see Isaac now. We then see the next scene where Ruby is peeking into Isaac's meeting. She overhears the knights mentioning to Isaac about how the captain is still hoping that he'll withdraw from the tournament as he had a bad dream about it. Isaac states to the knights that he can't believe people still believe such superstitions here. This response makes Ruby realize that Isaac's not alone. Ivan then asks Isaac if that is the reason why he called them for witches to babysit. Upon hearing this question, Ruby starts to wonder what they're talking about and decides that she should come back later. However, Isaac notices Ruby through the door creak. As he rises, he calls out for her, which makes her gasp. Ruby then walks inside the room and apologizes for interrupting and how she thought he was alone. Isaac gets close to Ruby and reassures her that it's fine and how she can join them. Even agrees and tells Ruby that she can have a seat right here. The silver-haired knight also thinks this is perfect and mentions to Ruby that they could use a new face as he was just getting tired of staring at a vicious one. Upon hearing this statement, Isaac punches the silver-haired knight on the head 
while Ivan compliments Ruby. Ruby nervously thanks Ivan. She also starts to think about how she didn't think that the knights would be so friendly to her after the tea party. However, she has now realized that for some reason, nothing seems to have changed. Ezek then states to the knight that they can all leave. Ivan starts to complain and asks Ezek if he's kicking them out after they came all the way here. A brown-haired knight tells Ivan to read the room. He then drags Ivan and the silver-haired knight out of the room as Ruby waves goodbye. Once they are gone, Isaac questions Ruby about what's got her so excited. Ruby responds, I'd say you got me excited. To be precise, it's the gifts you sent. As Isaac pats Ruby on the head, he mentions to her that he's glad that she likes them. Ruby states that they're all so beautiful and she loves them. She adds that she doesn't know how to, she can thank him. Isaac tells her that she can thank him by wearing them as often as she likes. Ruby asks Isaac if that's how it works. She also asks him what he thinks of the head ornament and if it looks nice on her. Isaac halts upon hearing this question and is speechless. Suddenly, he kisses Ruby and replies, You're so beautiful. I wonder if that's why that overgrown lizard kidnapped you. This response shocks Ruby and makes her wonder what he means by overgrown lizard. She also mentions to him that she's not sure what that's supposed to mean. Suddenly, Ruby notices a green flag on Isaac's desk and questions him about if he's going to Elmo's port tomorrow to greet the delegation. Isaac responds, Of course. I'll have to be there in person to greet my brother-in-law. Why do you ask? Do you want to come with me? Ruby states to Isaac that no, it's not that. We then learn that since other people think Valentino and Ruby are close, Ruby thought that she'd be the one who would have to go. She didn't think that Isaac would volunteer to welcome the delegation himself. Ruby wonders if Isaac's trying to be nice to his in-laws for her sake. Isaac then tells Ruby to stay at the banquet hall as they'll be there soon enough. He also reassures her not to worry about anything since they'll be safe with him. Upon hearing this reassurance, Ruby hesitantly hugs Isaac and mentions to him that she'll be waiting until he gets back. As she's hugging her husband, she wonders how he would react if he found out that she was actually abused by her family and have been pretending to be happy with them all this time. Ruby also wonders what Isaac would say if she told him that she still wants him by her side. As we are switching to the next scene, Ruby knows that she'll be fine because Isaac told her that he'll always be on her side. She knows that she needs to stay strong and is aware that while Isaac is fighting at the arena, she has her own battles to fight. The priests then thank Cardinal for making the long journey here as they are bowing down to him. The head priest then kisses Cardinal's hand and thanks the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Suddenly, Cardinal notices Isaac approaching. Once Isaac arrives, he hops off his horse and raises his hand to shake Cardinal's hand. He also welcomes him. As Cardinal smirks, he shakes Isaac's hand and thanks him. We then transition to the next scene where we see that the festivities have began. Everyone is at a banquet and they are chatting amongst one another. All of a sudden, someone calls out to Ruby. Ruby turns to see who it is and realizes that it's Andy. She also notices that he's rushing and hurrying over to her, so she tells him to slow down. Once Andy makes it to Ruby, he hands a drink to her and states that she must be thirsty. He also requests her to try the drink as it's wonderfully bubbly. Ruby thanks him for the drink. Andy then mentions to Ruby that she looks stunning today. Ruby states that he seems taller than the last time she saw him. Andy chuckles upon hearing this statement and tells Ruby that it must be the result of all the training he's been doing lately. He adds that he'll train even harder now since she's complimented him. Andy also starts thinking about how he actually decided to start training all because he failed to keep Ruby safe at the last banquet. However, he promises to keep her safe this time. As Andy is thinking about this, Ruby bets that Andy still looks the same even if he grows taller this his brother. She also believes that this is adorable. All of a sudden, someone calls out to Ruby, which causes her to halt. Upon hearing his voice, she realizes that it's Duke Bisigil Alfonso of the Lembrandt Kingdom who was her third ex-husband. As Ruby turns to see him, she wonders how could she ran into Alfonso here. Ruby then dashes upstairs while apologizing and mentioning to Alfonso that he's got the wrong person. As Ruby continues to dash upstairs, she starts thinking about how running into an ex-husband is just as horrible as bumping into an ex-boyfriend. 
On top of that, Ruby's aware that Alfonso later contributes to the downfall of her family after the annulment of their marriage due to his impotence. Ruby knows that, of course. It was Caesar who spread those rumors and how the whole world mocks Alfonso for being impotent because of her. She's sure that he has a grudge against her. She further wonders how she's supposed to avoid him for the entire banquet. Suddenly, Leah notices Ruby and calls out to her. This causes Ruby to come to a halt. Leah then asks Ruby why she's looked so extra beautiful today. Ruby thanks her and states that she's much prettier than she is. Leah tells Ruby that she doesn't mean that. She also questions her if she would like to go and see Princess Ariane with her and how Her Highness says she misses her too. As Ruby is looking away, she replies, I, I guess we could. Then let me just drop by the powder room first. Ruby then turns back around and gasps as she notices that Leah's upset. Leah then asks Ruby if she hates her and why she keeps avoiding her eyes. As she starts crying, she questions her if it's because of her stupid brother and if she hates her because of him. Ruby responds, No, not at all. Why would I hate you or Sir Ivan? Ruby also starts to panic in her head and realizes that Leah seems to think that she hates Ivan after what happened at the tea party with Freya. Leah then asks Ruby if it's because Freya was mean to her again. This question catches Ruby off guard. Leah adds that she knows that Freya keeps bullying her. However, before Leah is about to finish her sentence, Alfonso interrupts her by calling out to Ruby. This makes Ruby jolt up, and she realizes that he's caught up with her. She then turns around towards him and says, Your Grace! Long time no see! I never imagined I'd see you here! Alfonso questions Ruby if that means that she's glad to see her. Ruby mentions to him that of course she is. She also asks him if he'll be joining the gladiatorial tournament as well. Meanwhile, Leah is just happy that Ruby is going to play with her. Alfonso then replies, No, but my knight will be participating instead, as there is rather stiff competition this time. He also smiles at Ruby and states that she hasn't changed a bit. Ruby questions him for more clarification. Alfonso clarifies that she avoided him back then too. He adds that she never even gave him the chance to say goodbye. Ruby tells Alfonso that she didn't have much of a choice at that time. Alfonso mentions to Ruby that he understands, of course, and how he's sure there was a good reason. We then learn that Ruby couldn't even offer an apology without permission back then. Ruby then hesitantly says, Your Grace, I'm really sorry about what happened. Upon hearing this apology, Alfonso reassures her that it's all in the past and how he doesn't mind it anymore. He adds that, in fact, he's rather enjoying how people tease him about it. This reassurance makes Ruby realize that Alfonso is just as affectionate as the first time she met him. However, she knows that soon, he'll join the others to bring her family down. Alfonso then tells Ruby that he's actually just been newly engaged. He adds that she's a wonderful person, and she's more than he deserves. Ruby is amazed to hear this news and congratulates him on his engagement. Alfonso thanks Ruby and states that he's glad to see that she's met someone amazing as well. He adds that to be honest, he did think about them at times. He wondered how things would have been different between them if he had been braver at the time. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby requests Alfonso not to blame himself as they were both young back then. However, Alfonso disagrees with Ruby and mentions to her that he couldn't look after the lady to whom he had made his vows, to which is his fault. He adds that he was hardly a man. He was just a mediocre partner at best. Alfonso further states to Ruby that he knows this is selfish of him, but he wanted to see for himself that she's doing well. Ruby reassures Alfonso that she's doing fine and thanks him for his concern. All of a sudden, someone announces that they are presenting the Romana delegation and Lord Iski of Omerta. This announcement causes all of the guests to murmur amongst themselves. Alfonso then tells Ruby that he sees the lucky man who took her hand is here. Ruby gulps and clenches her fist upon hearing this statement. As she's watching her husband and brother enter, she knows that it's time for her to start acting again. As Ruby continues to stare at Isaac and Cardinal, she starts thinking about how she never imagined she'd ever see the two of them in one place. We then see the next scene where Cardinal is greeting the king and states to him that His Holiness, the Pope of Romana, sends his blessings. The king gives thanks to His Holiness. He also thanks Cardinal for making the journey here. 
we further learn that the queen isn't attending the banquet today. Normally, the queen is supposed to join the king in greeting any foreign delegations. But this isn't just any foreign delegation. This is a delegation of Romana's cardinals. Ruby believes that the king probably thought it wouldn't be wise to meet them with his queen, who was once a pagan dancer. She also knows that the king loves his queen, which is why he wouldn't risk diplomatic problems over her. The king then tells some of the priests that he was told that some of them had a hard time enduring seasickness. He adds that he has readied the royal physician and requests them to let him know if they require assistance. The priests start to laugh. They thank the king for his kind welcome and reassure him that they aren't seasick at all. The king starts to laugh upon hearing this response and states to them that he's glad that there's nothing to worry about. Ruby also starts thinking about how the seasickness was probably just them being hung over. Cardinal then greets Isaac's father and tells him that it's nice to finally meet him in person. Isaac's father agrees with Cardinal and welcomes him. He also apologizes to him for the humble welcoming party. Cardinal reassures Isaac's father that there's nothing to worry about and how it was an honor to be greeted by Iska. As Ruby is watching this interaction, she thinks that it's cringe and is amazed to see how courteous her brother is pretending to be. The king then rises up from his seat and says, We'll have time to discuss everything later, so please, enjoy the banquet. As he claps his hands. Once the king has done his speech, Alfonso calls out to Ruby. He then bows and mentions to her that he hopes that their paths will cross again. Ruby bows back. Once Alfonso leaves, Cardinal calls out to his sister and comes to a halt with Isaac. Upon hearing her name being called out, Ruby bows and states to her brother that she's been waiting for him to come. Cardinal tells his sister that she's become even more gorgeous since the last time he saw her. Isaac also starts to blush. Cardinal chuckles, and he further asks Ruby why she's being so formal with him. He adds that he weathered the rough seas to get here and questions her if she's going to give him her usual greeting. As Cardinal is smiling and waiting for the greeting, the guests start to mumble and murmur while watching. Suddenly, Ruby hugs her brother. As the siblings are hugging each other, Cardinal presses Ruby more towards him and mentions to her that marriage must be treating her well. Once they are done hugging each other, Cardinal mentions to Ruby that he was worried that she might be skipping meals because she was homesick. He adds that he's glad she looks happy to be here. As Cardinal is brushing Ruby's face, Ruby states to her brother that he should speak for himself. She adds that he's gotten even more handsome while she was away. She further tells him that she hopes he's not here to charm the innocent ladies of Arendelle, too. Cardinal reassures her that of course he isn't. Ruby then starts thinking about how it's a familiar sight with all the usual reactions. She also realizes that nothing has changed at all. All of a sudden, Isaac approaches Ruby. As he's smiling, he mentions to her that she looks absolutely stunning today. Just as always. Ruby smiles back at Isaac and states that it's probably because she's wearing the dress he gave her. She adds that he looks pretty as well. Isaac blinks upon hearing this praise and confirms with her if she said that he looks pretty. He also asks her if that's a compliment. Ruby reassures Isaac that of course it is. Isaac smiles upon hearing this reassurance. He then grabs Ruby's hand and kisses it. He also states to her that he's honored. This makes Ruby's heart skip a beat. As she chuckles, she tells Isaac that maybe she should tell him that more often. She also thanks him for bringing her brother here safely. Cardinal hears this statement and mentions to Ruby that she makes it sound as if he's supposed to be a prisoner of war. Isaac states to Cardinal that he doesn't strike him as someone who'd be taken hostage. Cardinal chuckles and tells Isaac that neither does he. He adds that he only meant it as a joke and thanks him anyways. As Ruby is staring at the two of them again, she realizes that here's a brother who loves his sister and a husband who loves his wife, both welcoming each other in joy. Then there's her, taking in all their love. Ruby also believes that people who don't know better might think it's a touching scene to behold. However, she knows that this is only a play, a big charade. And for this ridiculous comedy to continue, she has to keep playing her role. Suddenly, the head priest interrupts Cardinal and asks for forgiveness. He adds that his niece greatly admires him and that he would like to introduce her to him. The niece turns out to be Freya. Freya then greets Cardinal and thanks the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
She also mentions to him that it's an honor to finally meet him in person. Cardinal chuckles and states to Freya that it seems like every lady in Arendelle is a beauty. He adds that he's almost glad that his brother didn't come along. Ruby also tells Cardinal that if Enzo were here and acted as he does in the South, then they would all have to be on the ship to go back tonight. Upon hearing this statement, Cardinal agrees with his sister. As he pats Ruby on her shoulder, he adds that he's sure that she's sad that he couldn't come. Ruby mentions to Cardinal that this isn't really the case. She adds that he'd only cause a scene if he were here. Freya then states to Cardinal that she can finally see why Ruby values her family so dearly. She adds that after all, her brother is so charming. All of a sudden, Isaac interrupts Freya by snatching her hand and questioning her about if she's really that shameless. As he continues to clench her hand, he asks her if she's that foolish, which causes Freya to tremble in fear. As Iski is holding Freya's hand, she asks him what he's talking about. However, before Freya is able to finish asking her question, Iska interrupts her and questions her about if she can't even hear what he's saying anymore. The guests at the banquet also start whispering in the background and are wondering what's going on. Cesare then states to the Archbishop that it seems as if something clearly happening between those two. This statement causes the Archbishop to flinch. Cesare further asks the Archbishop about if it could be perhaps that his niece did something to Ruby. The Archbishop freezes and disagrees with Cesare. However, before the Archbishop is able to explain further, Freya shouts at him, which causes him to wince. Freya then mentions to Iska that he should let go of her hand so that they can talk about it. However, Iska interrupts her again while he clenches her hand and says, You don't seem to take my warning seriously. This is your final warning. Don't ever show yourself in front of me again, and don't even think about coming anywhere near Ruby. This statement makes Freya flinch and shocks her. Iska then releases Freya's hand. Freya quickly snatches it back. As her hand is twitching, Cesare tells the Archbishop that each person must know their place. He adds that he may want to teach his niece how to behave. As Freya's hand is trembling, she also bows and requests to be excused. She further starts to quiver and shiver as she mentions to everyone that unfortunately, she'll have to excuse herself since she's feeling rather unwell. Freya then quickly dashes off. The Archbishop tries to explain to Caesar that there seems to be a misunderstanding. However, Caesar interrupts him by calling him closer. The Archbishop comes closer and bows in front of him. As he's bowing, Caesar places his hand on his back and states to him that the way he handles things had been getting on his nerves for some time now. As Caesar brushes the Archbishop on his shoulder, he adds that he was under the impression that his head was still somewhat useful. He further questions him about if he was mistaken. This question surprises the Archbishop. Before the Archbishop is able to reply, Caesar tells him that he needs to catch up with his family now so he may leave. As he pats the Archbishop on the head, he adds that, of course, that doesn't mean that he's getting a second chance. Meanwhile, as Ruby is watching this incident occur, she starts to realize that the whole situation ended in the blink of an eye. She also realizes that Freya had always been hostile to her, and she put her in tight spots where she felt like she would suffocate, but she was just dismissed as if she was nothing at all. Ruby further believes that she's supposed to feel great about this, but it's only reminding her of everything she had to suffer and how helpless she had been. Suddenly, Ruby starts to feel sick and nauseous. Iski notices this, so he hugs Ruby and asks her if she's all right as she suddenly seems unwell. Ruby reassures Iska that she's fine and how she just felt nauseous for a second. Upon hearing this reassurance, Caesar mentions to her that he's glad that Ruby has a trusty husband she can count on. He also questions her about if she agrees. Caesar further adds that he was going to ask the Archbishop's niece for a dance, but unfortunately, his potential partner has left. He then holds Ruby's hand and asks her if she would mind being her brother's first dance. Caesar also states to Iska that he hasn't seen his sister in ages, so he's going his generous brother-in-law could spare her for today. He further questions Iski about what does he say to that. Upon hearing this question, as Iska brushes Ruby, he responds, I'll be fine. You go ahead. I'll be watching you from right here. Upon hearing this response, the two siblings then go to the dance floor while Iski is watching them. As they are dancing, Ruby tells her brother that it's been a while, so she might step on his foot. 
Caesar mentions to her that this is nothing new. He adds that she practically danced all over his feet when she was first learning and confirms with her about if she remembers. Upon hearing this confirmation, Ruby starts thinking about how she doesn't remember that since that wasn't her. Caesar then states to Ruby that he's actually rather adorable. Ruby asks her brother for more clarification. As Iske continues to watch the two of them dance, Caesar clarifies that he's talking about her husband. He adds that he seems desperate to keep her for himself. Ruby smiles and questions Caesar about what does he mean. Caesar replies, He even dressed you up so well. He didn't strike me as the type to sift through women's clothing to find something for you. What a pleasant surprise. As he leans closer to Ruby, he further asks her about if this is what people call first love. Ruby responds, I really don't get what you're trying to say, Caesar. There is no one quite like you in all of Romana and Arendelle combined. Why do you keep saying all these strange things? You have no idea how much I've waited for this day. You're almost making me feel upset. Ruby further questions her brother about how her father and younger brother are. Caesar explains to Ruby that their father is highly occupied with his new lover because Julia got pregnant. As for their younger brother, he joined the war in Rimini and caused some trouble. He adds that he got quite the beating from their father for that. Upon hearing this explanation, Ruby tells Caesar that this sounds just like their younger brother. Caesar then mentions to Ruby that he can't believe that their father assigned him as chief commander of the Vatican's troops and how it's a joke. Ruby states to her brother that she knows that no one is more suited to the job than him, but she wouldn't want him going to all those dangerous places. Upon hearing this response, Caesar whispers to Ruby that their younger brother may have his problems, but she caused her share of troubles too. This causes Ruby to start sweating. Caesar then adds that, however, they can discuss that later in private. He further lifts Ruby off her feet and says, For now, let's take a look around this pigsty. While Ruby is in the air smiling at her brother, all the guests start to watch the two of them dance, including Iski as he's swirling his drink around and looking at them with a serious face. Even then approaches Iska and states to him that for someone so notorious, he actually seems like a rather easygoing person. As the two of them continue to stare at Caesar, Iska agrees with Ivan's statement. He also asks him what he's so happy about. Ivan clears his throat and replies, I just danced with a beautiful lady, that's what. He also adds that he still doesn't understand why he asked them for that favor. Even further questions Iske about if someone planted weird ideas in his head. Iske asks him for more clarification. Ivan tells Iske if that isn't the case, then never mind. He also mentions to Iske that he should stop looking so serious as he looks like a man who'd stalk his own wife. Ivan adds that if he doesn't stop being so clingy, then even his angel of a wife will soon get tired of him. This statement makes Iske slightly angry. He also sighs, and wonders if he's being too sensitive about this. As he continues to stare at Ruby and Caesar dance, he starts to realize that Ruby has been genuinely happy to see her brother this whole time since they've been reunited, even though he had sold her off many times over. Iski also knows that the Pope probably had the final say in all of Ruby's previous marriages. However, that doesn't mean Caesar is any better. Iska further knows that he wouldn't have shown Caesar any respect if it weren't for Ruby, Iska then starts to wonder if Caesar knows that he sees fear and terror in Ruby's eyes from time to time. Iska also believes that if Caesar's the culprit, then he'd certainly be aware of it. Gie further wonders if Caesar shares some of the same pain that Ruby suffers from. Iska believes that if their close relationship stems from their shared experience of suffering, then perhaps he may be able to understand it a little. He also believes that if Ruby showed any sign of discomfort, he would have noticed. However, Iska knows that she didn't seem uncomfortable around her brother at all. Iska then wonders if maybe he's just overthinking it all. Suddenly, he pauses and disagrees with himself as he realizes something. He starts to think about how Ruby managed to hide her peculiar eating habits all the time. Iska used to think that Ruby wore her heart on her sleeve because her emotions seemed so easy to read. But despite her clumsiness over certain things, Iska believes that she could hide other things so thoroughly that no one would ever imagine it. Iska further starts thinking about how the scars on Ruby's fragile body makes him feel the limits of his patience. He wishes he could walk up to her and ask her everything right now. 
However, Iski is aware that if he forces the truth out of Ruby, then he would be putting her through yet another traumatic experience. He's worried that their newly found stability would fade away in an instant and he would leave him. That's why he couldn't bring it up. As Iski sips his drink, he decides that he needs to find the truth out through different means. We then see the next scene where Freya is outside in the balcony and recalling what Iska told her earlier. Freya then starts telling herself that it wasn't anything serious and how Iski will soon come back to her. She adds that she must look even further ahead and act accordingly. We then see the past where Iska was giving something to Ellen. Ellen confirmed with Iska if he's giving it to her because he has no one to give it to. Iska confirmed. Upon Freya noticing this, she jumped up and demanded Iska to give it to her next time. Iska glanced at Freya and said, As you wish, which made Freya smile. We are then back in the present, where we see that Freya is crying. As she's crying, she believes that Iski just can't see straight right now, because he's drink with brief pleasures that will never last. As Freya is rubbing her eyes and wiping her tears away, she also believes that there's no need for her to feel upset over something so trivial. We also see that Ellen is watching her from inside and looks sad. We then transition back to the banquet where Caesar calls out to Iska. Iska rises upon noticing Caesar and asks him about where Ruby has gone. As Caesar pats Iska on the shoulder, he responds, She went out for some fresh air. She'll be back soon. As Iski is staring at Caesar's hand on his shoulder, Caesar confirms with him if he's right to presume that he's not fond of banquets. Iska mentions to Caesar that he neither enjoys nor dislikes them in particular. Caesar states to Iska that this is a shame. He adds that he was wondering if he should invite him to one of their southern banquets someday. Iska tells Caesar that he shall be happy to attend one if he invites him. Caesar starts to laugh upon hearing this statement and confirms with him if it's because it would make Ruby happy. He further mentions to Iska that there is something he'd like to discuss with him and questions him if they can go somewhere quiet, away from all the noise. Iska agrees to Caesar's request. As they are leaving, Iska notices something with the food which causes him to stiffen. He then calls the attendant and demands him to clear all the dishes and serve them on different platters. The attendant is surprised to hear this and asks Iski for an explanation. However, Iska glares at the attendant and asks him if he should repeat himself. The attendant disagrees with Iska and nervously mentions to him that he shall replace them right away. As the attendant rushes to have the dishes served on different platters, Caesar looks back and is smiling. We then see the next scene where Iska and Caesar are sitting on couches. Caesar states to Iska that he has many reasons to be grateful to him. He adds that he's not being cynical. He really is grateful that he's sensitive enough to notice Ruby's feelings and take care of her. Upon hearing this statement, Iski questions Caesar about what he means. As Caesar is swirling his drink around, he replies, Well, I hoped I wouldn't have to bring this up, but Ruby suffers greatly from a broken heart. Iski asks Caesar if he can tell him more about this. Caesar replies, My father may obsess over his daughter now, but it took him a long time to accept Ruby into the family when she was little. Upon hearing this response, Iska states to Caesar that he knows that the topic of Ruby's birth raised a controversy in Romana a long time ago. Iska also starts thinking about how he never knew that the Pope had denied the existence of his daughter. We then learn that Ruby's name wasn't included in the family tree until she was four, and she was treated like extended family even after she was registered. As Caesar swirls his drink around, he tells Iski that he didn't have the power to protect her because he was too young at the time, and it's something he will regret for the rest of his life. Upon hearing this statement, Iska questions Caesar about if something happened. Caesar asks Iska that before they get into that, can he ask him something? He further questions him about what he was doing when he was around 13 years old. Upon hearing this question, Iska starts to remember his past where his mother was hanging from the tree. He also starts to remember how he was apologizing to his mother and requesting her to come down from there. Iska further starts to clench his hands. Caesar notices this and apologizes to Iska if it was a sensitive question for him. He adds that at that age, he had to follow his ambitious father everywhere and learn many things. We then learn from Caesar that Ruby was raised in a monastery located in their lands, where she lived like an orphan. Iski is speechless upon learning this about Ruby. 
Caesar further adds that they visited the monastery without informing them and how they saw his sister being treated in ways that they could never have imagined. Caesar further explains to Iski that the monks in the rural regions were a disgrace to their faith. That day, he persuaded his father to bring Ruby home. He oversaw Ruby's education from that point on. After what she had been through, it took a very long time before she could look people in the eyes and smile back at them. Upon hearing this explanation, Iska is still speechless. Caesar then mentions to Iska that, however, seeing how Ruby had improved over time, he mistakenly let himself become too relaxed at one point. Caesar adds that Ruby fell terribly ill about three years ago. Neither his family nor the doctors could find the source of her ailment, but she was bedridden for two weeks. Caesar also asks Iski if he knows the first thing Ruby did the moment she woke up after weeks of being sick. He further states to Iska that she went into the closet to hide. Caesar further tells him that only God knows what memories could have resurfaced while she was unconscious. He adds that she may be much better now, but he still worries for her in many ways. That's why he thanks God that she found him and could find greater stability through the bond of marriage, even though their Holy Father might not be too pleased with it. Iska has no response upon hearing this explanation and starts to feel bad for Ruby. We then transition to the next scene where we see that Ruby is outside in the balcony and feels woozy from all of the dancing. Suddenly, someone questions Ruby about if she's out here for some fresh air. Ruby turns around to see who asked her this question and realizes that it's Duke Bisically. She then mentions to him that she didn't know he was here. Ruby further asks him who's beside him. However, before she's able to finish asking her question, the stranger bows in front of Ruby and mentions to her that it is an honor for him to see her again. He further introduces himself as Cardinal Rokurua. Upon hearing his name, Ruby starts to realize that she knows him since her younger brother used to follow his advice and treat him like a brother, something he never did for Caesar. Ruby also knows that her younger brother never really had an interest in priests, but he always showed respect to Rokurua for being a man of faith. However, Ruby further knows that her younger brother still made fun of him, saying his priest principles ruined any chances of marriage. But she guesses that means he's just that pious. Ruby then states to Bisegli that it's been a while. Bisegli questions Ruby about if she's enjoying the evening air. Ruby agrees and tells him that she hopes she didn't interrupt his conversation. Bisegli reassures Ruby that she didn't as he was just catching up with his uncle. Ruby is surprised to hear this and mentions to him that she didn't know they were related. As Rokurua turns his head, he agrees with his nephew and states that unfortunately, he happens to have an impotent nephew who can't do his job in bed. He further takes a glance at Ruby and says to his nephew, I can't believe you missed out on this angel of a lady. You are the embarrassment of House Bisegli. Bisegli is speechless upon hearing the statement from his uncle. Ruby also starts smiling and thinking about how she doesn't know if she should be smiling as she feels guilty. Rokurua then tells Ruby that he shall be praying for Iski's victory in the tournament. Bisegli also mentions to Ruby that she shouldn't count on it as his uncle's prayers never bring about any miracles. Rokurua asks his nephew if that is supposed to be a joke. Meanwhile, Ruby just continues to nervously smile. The two of them then start to leave. As they are leaving, Bisegli states to Ruby that he hopes to see her again. Rokurua also calls out to Ruby and requests her not to hesitate to contact him if she is ever in need of his help. He adds that he may be from House Biseglia, but his allegiance lies with Romana. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby thanks Rokurua for his concern. Rokurua then bows and hopes that God will watch over her. As he's leaving, Ruby watches them leave and starts thinking about how Rokurua told her that his allegiance lies with Romana. Ruby then starts thinking about how the two of them are related. Somehow, her seeing Alfonso with a cardinal from Romana reminds her of a scene she had forgotten from the novel. We learn that the scene Ruby is referring to from the novel is the decisive moment of Romana's downfall, which occurs when traitors within the Vatican take the Holy Grail and hand it over to the Allied forces led by Alfonso. We also learn that the Holy Grail is said to have been used by the first god. The divine artifact holds the names of all those who have vowed to enter the priesthood. The Grail also wields a special power, one which enables the destruction of sacred cores. When priests are stripped of their priesthood, 
the Order destroys the center of their divine power, the Sacred Core, to ensure that they can never be sanctified again. The Holy Grail is used for such rituals. This is why all those who serve in faith fear House Borgia, the holders of the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail brought power to House Borgia. But due to its tremendous power, the Pope could not use it by his own discretion either. Nonetheless, it didn't take long for House Borgia to fall once they were robbed of this divine power. Ruby then starts to remember how it was said that the Holy Grail also has the ability to grant wishes. However, there was only a brief mention of it, and none of the books on theology had any records of wishes being granted. Ruby guesses that it's nothing but a superstition. Suddenly, someone calls out to Ruby. Ruby turns around to see who called out to her and realizes that it's the Ariane. Ariane compliments Ruby by stating that she looks as beautiful as a fairy today. Ruby thanks her and compliments her back by telling her that she looks gorgeous as well. She adds that the tiara looks so nice on her too. As Ariane lifts the tiara off her head, she asks Ruby if she would like to try it on. Ruby starts to panic and mentions to Ariane that it's her tiara. She adds that she wouldn't dare to put it on. Ariane states to Ruby that it would look much better on her. All of a sudden, someone tells Ariane that she shouldn't put Ruby in such an awkward position. Ruby looks up to see who said that and realizes that it's the queen. As Ruby is bowing, Her Highness mentions to her that she hasn't seen her since the banquet at the palace. She adds that Ariane has been telling her so much about her. She has always wanted to thank her, and she wishes that she could have seen her sooner. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby starts thinking about how she thought that the Queen wasn't in attendance today, but she was actually watching everything from afar. The Queen then bows and thanks Ruby so much for spending her time with Ariane. She adds that Ariane has been bright and jolly ever since she met her, and it has made her so happy as her mother. Upon hearing this grateful thought, Ruby realizes that Ariane takes after the Queen, and they look so lovely together. She also hopes that Ariane can always be loved and adored by her parents. The Queen then states to Ruby that it seems like she has settled into Britannia quite well. She adds that to be honest, she meant to invite her several times, but she was worried it might be an inconvenience to her. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby thinks about how considering the Queen's position in Britannia's high society, it wouldn't be a stretch to feel that way. She also reassures the Queen that this isn't the case. She adds that she would be honored to receive her invitation. As the Queen is smiling, she calls out Ruby's name and mentions to her that it seems like she is as affectionate as she is lovely. Suddenly, someone walks into the balcony and states to Ruby that he sees that she was having a chat with the Queen. Ruby looks up to see who it is and realizes that it's Caesar. As Ruby is looking drained, the Queen states to Caesar that it's been a while. Caesar smiles and questions the Queen about how she has been. Upon hearing this question, Ariane grasps onto the Queen and starts to hesitate. The Queen notices this and tells Caesar that Ariane seems to feel cold outdoors. She adds that they will be going back inside now. As the Queen is leaving and passing by Caesar, they both side-eye each other. Once the Queen is gone, Ruby mentions to Caesar that she was going to go back in soon, but it seems he just couldn't wait and came to her first. As Caesar taps Ruby, he disagrees with her and states that she should have seen her husband. He adds that he was reluctant to let him go and find her. Caesar further tells Ruby that there's really not much to see around here. He was looking forward to seeing the famed moon tower of the Angerbin Palace. He had no idea it would just be an outdated clock tower. Ruby mentions to Caesar that she thought he was delighted to be here, but she guesses he wasn't having much fun at all. Upon hearing this statement, Caesar pats Ruby on the cheeks and reassures her that he's delighted to see her. He adds that, however, the banquet here is terribly dull and how perhaps he should go and see the city instead. Ruby states to her brother that she hasn't walked around the city of Arendelle herself. Upon hearing this statement, Caesar asks Ruby if she's hesitating to go with him because of her husband. This question makes Ruby flinch. She then brushes her hair and says, well, he does tend to be picky, but he might let me go if you tell him about it. Caesar then tells Ruby that she doesn't seem to know much about her husband yet. As the siblings start walking inside, Caesar also questions Ruby about why doesn't she go and ask him herself and to tell him how her husband reacts. Once they are back inside, 
Ruby decides that she should better do as her brother says for now, since she has to figure out what he's up to. Ruby then walks through the banquet doors, and a lot of the guests rush toward her. They are relieved to see her, which startles Ruby. A lot of the guests also want to talk to her. Upon noticing this, Ruby starts to wonder why they are rushing over to her, and if it's because she danced with Caesar earlier. Ruby then apologizes to the guests and mentions to them that she is rather busy at the moment. All of a sudden, all of the guests come to a halt. Someone then states to Ruby that he's been looking for her everywhere. He also brushes Ruby hair. Ruby looks up to see who it is and realizes that it's Isaac. Once Ruby realizes that it's Isaac, she gives him a hug. As she's hugging him, she knows that it's only been a while, but she's so glad to meet him again. She also feels that she can finally breathe now. Rick smiles and brushes Ruby hair. He also looks back and gives all of the guests a scary face. Isaac then asks Ruby where she was. Ruby tells him that she went to the balcony to get some air. She further questions him about what did he do. Isaac replies, obviously, I was trying to find you. First, let's get something to eat. We then transition to the next scene where we see a big dining table with food. As Ruby is eating the food, Isaac's her if it's good. Ruby mentions to him that it is and questions him why she isn't eating. Isaac states to her that he isn't in the mood. Upon hearing this response, Ruby is surprised to hear this since she knows that Isaac eats a big lunch every day. However, Ruby can feel that something has been going on since a while ago. She also wonders why Easy keeps staring at her while she's eating. Isaac then tells Ruby that she doesn't need to eat more if she doesn't feel like it. Ruby is confused at first. She then changes the subject and states that her brother said he wanted to go to the festival with her. As she's wiping her mouth, she questions Isaac about what he thinks about this. Although it's not a lie, Ruby can't look at Isaac in the eyes while she's asking him this. Isaac mentions to her that he didn't know that her brother had such a hobby. Ruby states to him that her brother is quite easygoing. She adds that he's been like that since he was young. Isaac tells her that he will let the temple handle the guidance and that she can go if she wants to. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby starts thinking about how that was easier than she thought. She also notices that Isaac seems quite upset. She then asks him if he wants to come with her. Isaac responds, do you care? There's no need. You should spend time with your brother. You guys haven't met for so long. Ruby tries to respond to Isaac, but he grabs her cheeks and mentions to her to just go have fun and come back to him. He adds that it's not once or twice that she had an affair, so he's used to it now. Ruby shouts out that it's not an affair. Isaac then states Ruby that the capital is clean and safe today, so she doesn't need to be concerned about magical beasts. Ruby questions Isaac for more clarification. Isaac clarifies that the beasts near Arendelle were taken care of before the festival. He adds that since the cardinals are here, they won't come close. Upon hearing this clarification, Ruby starts to remember that traveling with Caesar is like having a holy shield with her. Isaac further tells Ruby that he will prepare a carriage for her. Ruby thanks him. We then switch to the next scene where we see Ruby in the carriage while Isaac and Caesar are outside. Caesar apologizes to Isaac for stealing Ruby from him. He adds that if it's not today, then he's afraid he won't have any free time left. He further mentions to Isaac that in return, he will pray for his blessings. Isaac asks him if that will work. Caesar states that it works differently for everyone. As Ruby is watching them talking, she wonders when did they have this relationship where they can make jokes. She also believes that Isaac must have been fooled by Caesar's fake image. She further wonders why she's bothered by this as she knows that it's not Isaac's fault for being tricked. Suddenly, Isaac calls out to Ruby and questions her about if there is any inconvenience. Ruby tells him that there isn't and wonders why he looks so handsome today. Isaac then brushes Ruby hair and mentions to her to have fun. Ruby agrees and tells him that she will go now. As Ruby is riding away in her carriage, she starts to feel guilty, but she also has such complicated emotions. She's aware that she's the one who has to endure all the hardships from now on. However, she wonders why she feels like she's doing such bad things. Meanwhile, Isaac is just watching Ruby's carriage riding away and he is speechless. 
As Ruby continues to ride in the carriage, she decides that she needs to first focus on Caesar. Taking a look around the street is just an excuse for her. Ruby knows that she won't spend time with her brother after the competition. This makes her realize that before then, she needs to come up with a reason for them to meet. Ruby further believes that she needs to explore his informants and that she has to try her best. Cesar then states to Ruby that they'll stop by the temple for a while. Ruby is confused and asks him what for. Cesar replies, No way. Are you going to wear that to the festival, Ruby? If you want to watch in private, you must wear a disguise. Whereas upon hearing this response, Ruby agrees with her brother. Cesar smiles back at her. We then see a new scene where the siblings have arrived to the temple and have put hoodies on to disguise themselves. Cesar tells Ruby to come this way. Ruby notices a hooded individual and realizes that he doesn't look like any ordinary Arundel monk. She decides to pay close attention as it seems to her that the monk is Cesar's spy. Cesar then mentions to Ruby that he seems cute. Ruby questions her brother for more clarification. This clarifies that he means her husband. He adds that he ordered the foolish paladin to be the spy. He's quite obvious, or maybe he purposely wanted him to find out. Upon hearing this explanation, Ruby wonders what spy her brother is talking about. She turns around to look and doesn't see anything. She also states to Caesar that she can't see anything and asks him if he could be wrong as there isn't anyone who would want to follow them. As Ruby is about to say more, Cesar grabs her and interrupts her by calling out her name. He also questions her if she has forgotten already. He adds that except for them, everyone else is their enemy. Ruby tells him that she hasn't forgotten it. She was just mistaken. She adds that she hasn't seen him this happy for so long. Cesar explains that teasing her husband is quite interesting. Ruby then takes a breath of relief. As the three of them continue to walk to the city, Ruby wonders if Isaac really sent a spy and also wonders if it was someone who hates her and her brother. Cesar then asks Ruby if she has always been watched like this. Ruby responds, It's always been like this. Isn't that why I always look forward to coming home? As Ruby is mentioning returning home, Cesar grabs her and questions her if she wants to mess everything up like this. He further confirms with her if that's right. Ruby is speechless and gives no response. Cesar then grabs Ruby's hand and says, First, let's get away from them. As they are running towards the capital, Ruby thinks that her brother is a crazy bastard. As Cesar and Ruby are walking through the capital, Caesar states to Ruby that everything's full of grease and sugar. Ruby tells her brother that this is a cold country after all. Cesar mentions to her that it's her first time taking a look around the capital, so she must find it fascinating. He also asks her if her husband lets her visit her often. Ruby questions Cesar that apart from him, who would let her wander around like this? Cesar agrees with her. He adds that walking together like this reminds him of old times. He further asks Ruby if she remembers. It was Christmas. Upon hearing this question, Ruby starts wondering about how could she forget. We then learn that during that Christmas, the snow was so pretty, and it was the day Cesar and Ruby hung out at Santa Maria. They didn't think about coming home until the next morning, but waiting for them at home was their drunk father. Since he had alcohol, he said a lot of horrible things to them, such as how dare they enjoy themselves until this hour, and if they are like this because they share the blood with their lowly mother, just because they got home late. Their father couldn't even hold it in front of his dear son. Even though it was all his fault since he was in promiscuous relationships and choosing courtesan to be the mother, Ruby then starts to wonder why Cesar is mentioning such bad memories. She also tells her brother that she was so afraid and thought that their father hit him. Cesar smiles and is slightly surprised to learn that she was worried about him. He states that she's very trustworthy. As the two of them are holding hands, Ruby starts thinking about how she just doesn't want to witness any violence. Cesar then reassures Ruby that their father is the one who should be afraid of him now. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby wonders what her brother means. Cesar further asks her if they should go over there. Ruby also realizes that she doesn't know all about her brother's relationships. We then transition to the next scene where we see the siblings watching a puppet show on the street. 
Ruby is watching the show and looks very sad. Caesar notices this and mentions to her that she doesn't seem to find it interesting. Ruby is confused upon hearing this and questions him about what is he talking about. Caesar is speechless at He then states to Ruby that they should go back to the temple. As he puts his hand on Ruby's shoulder, he confirms with her about if they have something to discuss. Ruby agrees with him that they do. Once they make it back to the temple, we see the next scene where Ruby is sitting by the mirror and knows that it's going to happen and that it won't be long. She believes that she just needs to hold it in, and then she's done. Ruby also believes that everyone will be fine if she suffers alone. It's both simple and familiar to her. All of a sudden, Sazer's spy states to Ruby that her brother is waiting for her on the other side. Upon hearing this statement, Ruby gets up and starts following the hooded individual. As she's following the person, she realizes that she has heard this thick southern accent before. He looks like Caesar's confidant to her. However, Ruby believes that he's clearly Romana's spy. The hooded individual then tells Ruby to come through this way, past the door. Once they are past the door, the hooded individual closes the door. Meanwhile, Ruby looks up towards the staircase. Suddenly, she hears a noise which causes her to halt and wonders if the temple's doors are closed. The hooded individual then asks Ruby if she's going to go inside. This makes Ruby flinch. She then walks up the stairs and enters the room. Upon entering, Ruby realizes something. Cesar also mentions to Ruby to come in. This Ruby questions her brother where she is. Cesar replies, it's the archbishop's office. I said I'd use this place. The old man was taken aback. Isn't there right, Pietro? The hooded individual takes off his hood and reveals himself. Caesar adds that he wants to lick the sole of her feet after all. Ruby is shocked to see Pietro and realizes that his voice is familiar since he was the guy who crushed her foot. Cesar then states to Pietro that he has had a lot of trouble in this pig pen. Pietro tells Caesar that he was just waiting for him. He also asks him if he knows how homesick he was. Meanwhile, Ruby believes that Pietro stepped on her foot because it would interrupt her wedding night. She also wonders if Caesar put him up for that. Caesar further questions Pietro if he wants him to comfort him. Pietro mentions to him that he won't say no. Meanwhile, Ruby is further thinking about how she didn't expect to meet Caesar's henchmen. Here, Ruby is aware that the Caesar she knows, no matter what happens, will always stick to Pietro. As Ruby continues to stare at the two of them, she wonders if her brother really sent his henchmen to the north just to keep an eye on her. She also wonders how long Pietro has been here. Cesar then states to Pietro that it should be pricking his conscience. He adds that he didn't do anything right. Pietro tells him that he will accept his punishment for that. Upon hearing this statement, Cesar asks Ruby what he should do with him and if she can tell him. Ruby hesitantly questions her brother about what he's talking about. Cesar confirms with Ruby if it's because of her that Pietro is being scolded. Ruby replies, I don't understand what you're talking about. Have I been spied on this whole time? Cesar sighs and mentions to her that his dear sister ran away from home. He also questions her what kind of brother wouldn't be worried. Upon hearing this question, Ruby realizes that if what her brother is saying is true, then Pietro came to the south after she ran away and that he's been constantly following her. Ruby further starts to tremble. She tries to calm herself down and tells herself that at times like this, she needs to think carefully. Ruby believes that if she causes a scene, then everything that she's done so far would be for nothing. Ruby then states to her brother that she is always on the right path and asks him what made him do this. She also questions him about why did he do this to her. Caesar responds, people said you tried to poison the archbishop's niece in the temple. You're considered a murderer in the north. Upon hearing this response, Ruby points at Pietro and mentions to him her brother. She thought that he ordered him to do it. She further starts to cry and asks him if he knows how overwhelming it was for her. Cesar brings up the Marquis lady from before and questions Ruby about what good is it if he gets rid of those people. He also asks Pietro if he knows anything about that. Sir Itro is confused upon hearing this question and states that he came here after hearing that Ruby ran away from home. He adds that it's his first time hearing this news. 
Suddenly, Ruby realizes that if Isaac ascends the throne, then the future of the North will vary depending on his spouse. She also starts remembering what Freya told her, which was that in the end, she'd be the mother of the North. Ruby is aware that Freya spilled tea onto herself and cleverly mixed truths with lies. She further believes that if Cesar hadn't interfered in that incident, then the only conclusion would have been Freya's own play, which was to get rid of her and be with Izek, the future king. Ruby then realizes that the easiest way that Freya could obtain those stones was from the archbishop. Suddenly, Pietro whispers to Cesar that it appears that the archbishop went behind their backs. Cesar agrees with Pietro. He then tells Ruby that he understands her doubts and confirms with her about if it's too far beyond common sense. He also asks her that if the assassination was intentional, would it be in the temple with those stones? Caesar further mentions to her that she must have been so afraid and that her judgment is clouded right now. He then gets up, touches Ruby's face, and states that there's no excuse for her impulsive action. Ruby nervously tells him that she wasn't in the right state of mind and that she didn't think clearly. Caesar grabs Ruby by the shoulders and questions her if she was also out of her mind when her husband hugged her. He also mentions to her to tell him. Ruby states to Caesar that she is always thinking about it. She also feels scared. Caesar then says, judging by the look of your husband today, it doesn't seem like the relationship is forced. Can you be honest with me? As Ruby is thinking of an answer, she feels so scared and wonders what this strange feel. She also wonders that even if she messed up the plan, is it something to be so angry about? Ruby further decides that the most important thing right now is that she must not reveal her true intentions. Ruby then tells Caesar that he doesn't know anything. She adds that her husband is completely different from anyone she has ever met. He's suddenly treating her so kindly, but it was because he thought she was going to die. Cesar then asks her why did he search Arendelle so desperately to find her. Ruby questions him back about if he thinks he did it because he was worried. As Ruby starts to cry, she also asks him how many times must she say this. She adds that she was really scared. He should know and that she wanted to die because she was being pushed upon hearing these statements. Cesar asks her if she was hit. Ruby questions him for more clarification. Cesar then calls Isaac a bastard and demands Ruby to tell him if he hit her. Ruby starts to panic upon hearing this question. She then says, I worked so hard to please him and suddenly... He wasn't as rough anymore. It was not until then that I knew what I could do. Cesar is speechless. Ruby adds that at that time, survival was important to her. It didn't matter what she did as long as she could go home. Cesar agrees with Ruby. He then grabs Ruby's hands and tells her that she has been through so much. He adds that this place was too much for her to handle in the first place. He was opposed to it because he was afraid she'd turn out like this. He wouldn't care what father thinks this time. But not matter what, it's extremely blasphemous to use lust to get what she wants. This statement shocks Ruby. Caesar further mentions to her, he wouldn't care if it was someone else. But she's the angel of Sistine. He just can't believe it. Cesar also asks Ruby if she's the Pope's only daughter and why has she changed like this? As Ruby nervously tries to answer, Caesar interrupts her and states that, of course, she isn't the only one to blame. He adds that this filthy and ugly den has tainted her to no avail. Cesar further questions Ruby about how did she pick up such a bad habit in the short while that they didn't meet. Ruby starts to sweat nervously as she's staring into Cesar's eyes. Cesar then reassures her that it's all right, since reflection means that there's room for improvement. He then turns around and Ruby tells him that her husband will soon find out. Upon hearing this statement, Caesar confirms with Ruby about if the two of them had time to see each other during the festival. Ruby tells her brother that if her husband comes to visit her at night, then they'll have time. She adds that no matter if she stays in Angurban Palace's accommodation during the festival, her husband will come find her anyway. Upon hearing this response, Caesar starts to approach Ruby and mentions to her that it's strange that she can just behave well just like usual. He also asks her if he should teach her those things again. This question shocks Ruby. Cesar further states to her to lie down on the table and lift her dress. He adds that he needs to correct all her bad habits. 
Cesar tells her not to be upset, since this is just because he loves her. However, Ruby doesn't listen and just starts to tremble. Cesar then says, I'll tell you this one last time, so remember it properly, Ruby. Your husband is consumed with carnal desires. He's acted like he'd give you this whole heart since the first night. But don't forget Ruby. Feelings developed from bodily attraction do not last long. Caesar adds that even if their bodies intertwine, there can't be affection. That's worse than being an animal. Meanwhile, Ruby falls to the ground and starts crying as she continues to tremble in fear. Caesar then grabs her face and mentions to her that since she's tired, he will give her a solution. He adds that if her husband treats her so horribly, then she should tell him that she will go back and stay with him. As Caesar is mentioning this to her, Ruby is in pain and is so tired. She doesn't like this and wants it to stop. Ruby then states to Caesar that she was wrong. All of a sudden, Caesar lifts up Ruby's face and tells her that this night will be long. We then see Ruby's clothes on the ground and a shadow of her sitting on a table. Meanwhile, Caesar is holding a whip and is about to strike Ruby with it multiple times. We then transition to the next scene where Ellen calls out to Isaac and questions him about where Ruby is. I states to his cider that she's taking a walk with Cesar. Ellen is shocked to hear this and asks him for an explanation. She also questions him about why did he ask her to keep an eye on him if he let Ruby go so easily. Jose is sack replies, there's something I need to find out. Instead, I sent Camus and Galar to the street. Upon hearing this response, Ellen notices Isaac shaking his legs in anxiety and wonders why he let them go. Ellen then tells her brother that the snowstorm is coming. She also asks him when Ruby will be back. Suddenly, Isaac hears a sound. The two siblings rush to their balcony to check. Ellen questions her brother if that's Ruby. Isaac agrees with his sister and mentions to her that she came back at just the right time. Please make sure to subscribe. Special thanks to all of my Patreon members. Why not watch another manhole recap on my channel by clicking on this video right here?